Good afternoon uh, and welcome to this uh, subcommittee hearing. Uh, let me just uh, say at the outset that the schedule has changed drastically in the last few days so that uh, uh, normally we were scheduled to be in last night and voting. Uh, that schedule changed and those, uh, those votes dropped off. As well as this schedule, uh, this hearing today was scheduled to occur at 10 o'clock this morning. So with all of that, uh, we have members flying in. I know Mr. Chaffetz is flying in from Utah, and I know uh, uh, Mr. Bilbray is flying in from California, and, and others are flying in as well. So uh, we may see some members uh, coming in mid-hearing, but uh, we are determined to, to address the issues before us. I would like to give a few minutes to my colleague, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who is actually uh, the driving force, one of the driving forces behind this hearing itself. Uh, what I could do is to begin with my uh, introductory statements that would uh, get those out of the way. Uh, this hearing is described as the local control of the United States Parole Commission, increasing public safety, reducing recidivism, and using alternatives to reincarceration in the District of Columbia. Uh, The subcommittee is now in order. The Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia hearing has now come to order. Uh, I welcome all the Republican and, and Democratic members of the subcommittee, witnesses, and all those of you in attendance. As you are all aware, the purpose of this afternoon's hearing is to examine a host of issues related to the offender, reintegration, recidivism, and overall public safety in the nation's capital. The chair, the ranking member, and the subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make an opening statement, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Uh, in, in evidence of the, uh, the absence of uh, several uh, of our members, uh, I will allow members to submit any statements for the record uh, during the course of this hearing and for, as I said, three days beyond. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Again, I thank you for your attendance here at the subcommittee's fourth DC-related oversight uh, committee hearing entitled The Local Role of the United States Parole Commission, Increasing Public Safety, Reducing Recidivism, and Using Alternatives to Reincarceration in the District of Columbia. Today's hearing gives the subcommittee the opportunity to examine the impact of the United States Parole Commission and other related uh, federal agencies on public safety in the District of Columbia Currently, the District of Columbia is the only jurisdiction where the control over aspects of its local criminal code offenders is determined by the policies and practices of federal agencies, such that the parole commissioner or the court services and offender supervision agency, uh, the National Capital Revitalization and Self-Government Improvement Act of 1997, also known as the Revitalization Act, transfer the responsibility for and the cost of certain state criminal justice functions, such as the house parole and supervised release of adult felons convicted under the DC Criminal Code from the District of Columbia to the federal government. While considerable prog progress has been made over the past 10 years since the enactment of the Re Revitalization Act, the District of Columbia continues to confront a host of challenges regarding the implementation of effective felon supervision, reentry, and revocation systems and practices. With nearly 6,500 DC code felons in custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons and over 15,000 offenders on supervised release with the CSOSA, it is critical that the subcommittee conduct the requisite oversight to ensure that the hybrid mix of federal and local criminal justice responsibilities in the District of Columbia is being carried out seamlessly, consistently, and effectively as possible. This is the context in which today's hearing has been called, and I thank our witnesses for agreeing to join us in conducting such a dialogue. Today's, hearings, it, today's hearing is also intended to address other related policy challenges, such as the difficulty of keeping DC code felons who are housed in uh, Bureau of Prisons facilities miles away from the District of Columbia connected to their families and communities. The use of graduated sanctions versus automatic revocation and the pending agenda of the USPC given its newly appointed leadership. I'd like to again thank my colleague, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton for her tireless effort in this policy area. 
and for recommending today's hearing topic. Again, I thank all of those in attendance this afternoon, and I look forward to, the hearing, uh, to hearing the testimony of our witnesses. This concludes my opening statement, and in the absence of uh, the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, I now recognize Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton of the District of Columbia for five minutes. Thank you, thank you very much, Chairman Lynch. With your permission, I will uh, simply summarize my opening statement and ask that the remainder be placed in the record. Uh, all the thanks is due to you, Chairman Lynch, for scheduling this hearing on the U.S. Parole Commission. Uh, the first since uh, President Barack Obama appointed former D.C. Police Chief Isaac Fullwood, Jr., chair of the U.S. Parole Commission. The unprecedented local responsibility of the U.S. Parole Commission gives this agency important responsibility for public safety in the District of Columbia today. In 2009, uh, approximately 6% of the crimes uh, have been committed thus far by offenders while on parole or supervised release, uh, accounting for 4% of violent arrests, 3% of weapon arrests, and 6% of drug arrests. While the Parole Commission is a federal agency created by, funded by, the Congress uh, since 1930, today it fits squarely within the subcommittee's jurisdiction uh, uh, under the 1997 uh, Capital City Revitalization and Self-Government Improvement Act, which transferred certain functions to the federal government and, of course, uh, it is squarely within our federal jurisdiction over federal parolees. Uh, this transfer of the function of the cost to the District of Columbia was made during the district's uh, most serious uh, financial crisis. It means that uh, the Bureau of Prison now has jurisdiction over 9,500 uh, D.C. Code felons. All of those will one day pass through the U.S. Parole Commission, many of them are doing so now uh, from the U.S. Bureau of Prison, pr Prisons in facilities located across the, the United States. I'll be particularly interested to hear about new and particularly, uh, I may, if I may say, ex uh, 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 new approaches, not just existing approaches, but new approaches that can meet the Commission's unique local responsibilities to the District of Columbia to increase public safety and reduce recidivism. And I believe what we hear today will be instructive to jurisdictions all across the United States, uh, Mr. Chairman, because jurisdictions are releasing people from prison because they can't afford to hold them. In a the good time, they just took in everybody they could find who looked like he had committed a crime. Now they're putting people out on the streets without the kind of careful work that's being done by the U.S. Parole Commission and that is recommended by the experts uh, that you have called uh, b before us. Um, the serious changes in the economy today means that today's hearing, while particularly important to the District of Columbia, uh, it needs uh, to, to have the attention of the nation. Incarceration and reincarceration are very expensive and, ver and have very poor crime reduction records. Incarceration separates and strains families and communities with little crime or recidivism reduction to show for it. We're pleased to welcome all of today's witnesses uh, at your urging, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and I uh, look forward, as I know you do, to their testimony. I thank the gentlelady. At this time, I would like to welcome all of our witnesses to, to take their assigned seats as we begin uh, this portion of our hearing. Is Mr. Cornell Jones here? Oh, okay. I know we have changed the order of the uh, uh, witnesses, so. Welcome. 
it is the uh, committee policy that all witnesses to provide uh, testimony are to be sworn in. Uh, could I ask you to please rise and raise your right hands? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that all the witnesses have indicated in the affirmative. Their entire statements, uh, the printed statements are already included in the hearing record. Uh, let me begin by introducing the, the panel. Panel one, uh, beginning with Mr. Isaac Fullwood is the chairman of the United States Parole Commission. On November 20, 2004, Isaac Fullwood was appointed as a U.S. Parole Commissioner by President George W. Bush. He served 29 years as a member of the Metropolitan Police Department and in 1989 became the 25th Chief of Police. Ms. Adrian Poteet was named as the Acting Director for Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency in 2000, I'm sorry, July 2008. In this position, Ms. Poteet oversees a federal agency which was created by the D.C. Revitalization Act of 1997. Ms. Laura Hankins is the special counsel to the director at the Public Defender Service of the District of Columbia. She represents PDS in commenting on legislation before the D.C. City Council, the District of Columbia Sentencing Commission, and on the committee responsible for drafting the district patent criminal jury instructions. Her management responsibilities include supervising the Defender Services Office, the PDS division responsible for determining the eligibility of defendants to receive court-appointed lawyers, and for initially signing lawyers to, assigning lawyers to criminal cases. Uh, Mr. Jesse Janetta is a research associate for the Urban Institute. He has research and evaluation experience addressing issues related to prisoner reentry, parole, and probation supervision, and risk prediction. Prior to coming to the Urban Institute, Mr. Janetta was the research specialist at the Center for Evidence-Based Correction at the University of California, Irvine. Mr. Martin Horn is the Distinguished Le Lecturer in the Department of Law and Policy, I'm sorry, Law and Police Science at John Jay College. He was appointed by Mayor Michael Bloomberg to serve as Commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation, effective January 1, 2002. One year later, Mayor Bloomberg appointed him to serve as Commissioner of the New York City Department of Correction, and he held both positions simultaneously until coming to John Jay in September 2009. Okay. I understand, I understand now that uh, Mr. Charles Thornton will be appearing in place of Mr. Col Cornell Jones. Uh, Mr. Thornton uh, is in place of uh, Mr. Cornell Jones, who was the chairman of the Returning Citizens United Incorporated, a D.C.-based advocacy group for the formerly incarcerated. Under Mr. Jones' leadership, Returning Citizens United Incorporated has made a great stride, great strides in redirecting many at-risk youth and adult men from self-destructive behavior to positive and self-directed behaviors. Again, I, I welcome all the witnesses, and I invite uh, Mr. Fullwood to offer a summation of your statement for five minutes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. First, let me say uh, good afternoon and thank you to the Chairman Lynch for inviting us to the hearing. And especially thanks to Congresswoman Norton, who is my Congresswoman, uh, for inviting me and taking an interest in the United States Parole Commission. The Parole Commission today, as mandated by Congress, carries out the following duties making parole and revocation decisions for parole-eligible federal offenders, making parole-eligible and revocation decisions for parole-eligible D.C. Code offenders, setting and enforcing the conditions of supervised release for District Columbia Code offenders, making release decisions 
for United States citizens convicted of crimes in another country who wish or elect to return to the United States for the service of sentence. Most of the Commission's day-to-day -day work involves the D.C. Code offenders. As of the year ending fiscal year 2008, about 70% or 9,236 of the persons under com the Commission's jurisdiction of 12,696 were D.C. Code offenders. Of the 1,842 revocation hearings conducted by the Commission during FY 2008, 87% of them, or 1,608, were D.C. Code offenders. In the 12 months ending August the 31st, 2009, roughly 90% of the 2020 warrants issued by the Commission were for D.C. Code offenders. The Parole Commission is a public safety agency charged by federal and district common law with the duties of enforcing public safety. The Commission keeps in mind for all of its decisions that the public safety is paramount. For our work involving parole decision making, the Commission uses guidelines that look at the severity of the crime for which the person has been sentenced, the likelihood that the offender will commit another crime if released, and prison conduct and prison program performance. The Commission is presently involved in redefining the instrument to improve its predictive powers. In other words, we've done a study. The area of the Commission's work that is growing is setting conditions of release and conditions of supervision. The Commission works closely with the Court Service and Offender Supervision Agency to ensure that offenders under supervision are carefully monitored and are given an opportunity to acquire skills and to receive treatment that will enable them to become good citizens. CSOSA has established a reentry and sanction center to provide assessment and reentry programming for offenders as well as residential sanctions for offenders who violate release conditions. The Commission fully supports the program by ordering as a condition of release from prison, the offenders identity, identified by CSOSA as needing the programs that can be assessed by the by the Reentry and Sanction Center. The Commission also imposes on such offenders a condition of supervision that requires participation in treatment programs recommended as a result of the Reentry and Sanction Center assessment. CSOSA reports regularly to the Commission on each offender it supervises for the Commission. And if it becomes necessary to remove someone from the community, CSOSA will ask the Commission to issue a warrant. We would like to see people under supervision succeed and become good citizens. If persons under supervision have become a risk to the public, we will issue a warrant. To avoid having to issue a warrant by intervening when the behavior of someone under supervision starts to deteriorate, CSOSA and the Commission have established the reprimand sanction program. When CSOSA becomes concerned that an offender's behavior is becoming questionable, a reprimand sanction hearing is scheduled. A commissioner conducts an internal and informal hearing with the offender. A representative of the public defender service and the supervising officer discuss the matter. An improvement plan is worked out for the offender with the goal of motivating offenders to, cha to change whatever behavior has caused concern before that behavior requires the commission to take an action. It has been my experience both as chief of police in Washington, D.C. and as a commissioner that a major problem faced by returning offenders is drugs and alcohol. Addiction makes it difficult for returning offenders to be law-abiding and to stay out of trouble. The Commission is involved in two programs designed to address addiction problems in the District of Columbia offender population. The programs offered 
inpatient addiction treatment in a secure environment of offenders arrested on a commission warrant, changing relatively minor violations of conditions of supervision. Mr. Fullwood, mm -hmm. uh, sir, you um, over by a couple of minutes. Could I ask you to just sum up and let me give you the two programs. I think a lot of the information you want to provide will be uh, through the question and answer, and I and I appreciate the the comprehensiveness of your statement. Okay. The, the two programs that we talked about are the Residential Secure Substance Abuse Program, which is run by uh, the D.C. Department of Corrections. There's a program designed for a 90-day period of behavioral modification to deal with the problem of addiction. The second program is the Secure Residential Treatment Program, which is run by CSOSA, uh, along with the United States Parole Commission, uh, which is good for 180 days to, to try to change the be offender's behavior. Those are the two programs, and when you think about um, the reprimand sanction hearing, another program designed specifically to address not putting people back in, through incarceration, but trying to figure out what's the best method to get them to be motivated to do a better job. Thank you very much. Ms. Poteet, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman Lynch, Congresswoman Norton, and other distinguished members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify. I am pleased to appear before you to head today on behalf of the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency to discuss the work of CISOSA and its connection with the U.S. Parole Commission. CISOSA is a federal law enforcement agency with a unique local mission. The agency supervises approximately 16,000 men and women on probation, parole, or supervised release in the District of Columbia. Two-thirds of these offenders are probationers who have gone to prison and are accountable to the D.C. Superior Court rather than the U.S. Parole Commission. Most of the remaining third, about 6,000 offenders, are on parole or supervised release and have a term of incarceration in the Federal Bureau of Prisons and are accountable to the USPC. Our offenders face many challenges. 30% have a history of violent crime, 64% have a history of substance abuse, 13% have a formally diagnosed mental illness. Many others have undiagnosed mental health conditions. Nearly 40% do not possess a high school diploma or GED, and only 47% of our population is employed. On an average day, 800 offenders reside in D.C. homeless shelters or have housing situations that are considered unstable. Stable housing and employment are critical factors affecting the likelihood that an offender will commit a new crime, violate the terms of their release, and ultimately whether or not they'll be revoked to incarceration. We partner with numerous local and federal agencies and community-based organizations to access the education, training, employment, family services, mental health and substance abuse treatment, and other services that our clients need. Yet, while we recognize the critical importance of these services, CISOSA's critical mission is public safety, and our main strategy is in support of the public safety mission in close, for close supervision. Through a system of graduated sanctions, CISOSA imposes increasingly restrictive penalties on offenders for violating their release conditions. Sanctions can involve increased office visits, drug testing, GPS monitoring, or residential placement and halfway back, or the 102-bed reentry and sanction center, RSC, that we opened in 2006. Our Office of Research and Evaluation is currently working with the U.S. Parole Commission on the development of a new violation sanctions matrix and the integration of that tool with CISOSA's own graduated sanction matrix. The alignment of these tools will provide uniformity in the response to supervision violations by parolees and supervised releasees in the future. In May 2006, in conjunction with the USPC, we created an alternative sanction option called the Reprimand Sanction Hearing for offenders on parole and supervised release. 
This program permits the USPC a face-to-face -face opportunity to address an offender's non-compliant behavior as a last step before formal parole revocation hearing. From May 2006 to July 2009, 259 hearings were conducted. Participating offenders have shown a higher level of compliance following these hearings. USPC and CSOSA are in daily contact regarding the adjustment of the 6,000 offenders under their jurisdictions and our supervision. Routine communications will include both recommendations to reward compliant behavior as well as placement on inactive supervision. We also do the submission of AVRs on offenders that are non-compliant. Just yesterday, CSOSA launched the new Secure Residential Treatment Program, SRTP, which will serve as an alternative placement for eligible DC code offenders on parole or supervised release who face revocation for technical violations, including substance abuse, and in some cases, new criminal violations. We are partnering in this endeavor with the USPC, the Department of Corrections, and the Public Defender Service. The initial pilot program will consist of a 180-day treatment regimen, including and involving 32 offenders, and is scheduled to run until March 2010. During this pilot demonstration, CSOSA will fund and operate the Treatment Intervention Center. The USPC has been an integral partner in our efforts to establish the SRTP program and to implement the pilot demonstration. We look forward to the continuation of our close collaboration with the U.S. Parole Commission, as well as our local and federal partners, and work together to enhance public safety while reducing the rate of incarceration as one of our alternate goals. I appreciate the opportunity to, to appear before you today, and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Hankins, you're now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Laura Hankins, Special Counsel to the Director of the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. Thank you for the invitation to testify today on the local role of the United States Parole Commission. The Public Defender Service has represented over 90 percent of D.C. code offenders who have faced revocation of parole or supervised release since the Parole Commission replaced the D.C. Board of Parole. Thus, we have a unique perspective on and a strong interest in the Commission's increasingly local role. Reducing recidivism increases public safety. One way to reduce recidivism is to develop and appropriately use alternatives to reincarceration. PDS commends the Commission and CISOSA on the development and increasing use of two drug treatment programs and on the continuing work of the sanction reprimand hearing. My understanding is um, uh, that those hearings are held approximately three days a month and, and we are very gratified to hear the attention it's getting at this hearing and hope that signals um, that the Commission will hold those hearings more often. It should be noted, however, that the need to develop reincarceration alternatives and to fine tune the systems concerning who should get such an alternative and who instead should be reincarcerated is becoming increasingly acute as the population over whom the Commission has authority changes. As a result of the Revitalization Act, parole was abolished in the district, effective August 5, 2000, and replaced by supervised release and revocation terms. Generally speaking, terms of supervised release are shorter than the amount of time an offender is on parole, and the revocation term, the amount of time for which an offender can be sent back to prison if he is revoked, is also shorter. This determinate sentence supervised release scheme gives the Parole Commission and CSOSA an opportunity to concentrate the resources on those persons most likely to reoffend, that is, persons recently released from prison. And in the long run, the scheme should mean fewer people on supervision at any given time, particularly when compared with having to supervise people who are on parole for decades or for life. But it also means that the Commission needs to examine how it budgets the supervision and revocation time with which it has to work. The question of whether it makes sense, for example, to send someone back to prison for 12 months for having committed a low-level technical violation like testing positive for marijuana use is more critical to answer when the offender can only be put back on supervised release for two more years, and if he violates again, can only be sent back to prison for at most 12 more months. At a hearing on the commission held by this subcommittee last year, the director of PDS was afforded the privilege of testifying. 
At that time, PDS noted a number of issues that we hoped to see the Commission address. Two issues in particular deserve mention today. One, the salient factor risk assessment tool needed, needed to be redesigned in order to account for factors that correlate to recidivism and in order to be relevant to the population most often being assessed by the tool, offenders facing revocation, not offenders seeking a parole grant. Two, the corresponding guidelines that direct the sanction for parolee upon finding a violation needed to be recalibrated to shorten the reincarceration periods and allow reinstatement of low-risk supervisees for low-severity violations. There might be reasons for the Commission not to address these issues, though since specific fixes were recommended by an expert the Commission helped to hire, and since the Commission voted to adopt those recommendations, it's difficult to imagine what those reasons might be. But even if one assumes that the status quo provides good reason not to follow through on the recommendations, the climate change facing the Commission in the form of offenders in a very different sentencing system should give the Commission serious pause. If D.C. offenders continue under the authority of the Commission, one day there will be no more parole grant hearings, the very type of hearing for which the salient factor tool was designed. Instead, the Commission's work will essentially be all revocation hearings. But using the salient factor score at revocation hearings is like forcing a square peg into a round hole at every hearing. It is impossible for a parolee or supervisee facing revocation to get a perfect score. Therefore, it is impossible under the corresponding guidelines to get a recommendation of no reincarceration. Re In addition to changing some of its systems, how the Commission exercises its discretion should also be examined. PDS noted last year that while the Commission has the discretion to allow supervisees to remain in the community pending their final revocation hearings, it essentially never exercises that discretion and opts instead to detain at the jail virtually all persons facing revocation. This is no small issue. Last week, roughly 600 people, approximately 20 percent of the D.C. jail's population, were there for parole revocations. While according to permission, commission procedures, the time between an arrest on a violation and the final revocation decision should not be more than 86 days, the current wait is closer to four months. Even putting aside the justness of exercising its discretion to allow some parolees and supervisees to remain in the community, particularly those who are employed and have not long lost contact with their supervising officer, the climate change facing the Commission should push it towards using its discretion to release people. Supervisees get credit for time spent in jail. With shorter overall terms of supervision and revocation, reflexively using jail time is essentially wasting the resource of supervision and revocation time. Using up four months in jail on a violation that is ultimately not supported or which results in reinstatement on parole means four fewer months of supporting that offender's reentry and supervising his behavior to increase public safety, and four fewer months as a sanction should he later violate his supervised release conditions. The Public Defender Service appreciates the opportunity for treatment and success on supervision provided by the Commission's new drug programs and continues to applaud Chairman Fullwood on sanction reprimand hearings as he champion, has championed them. The climate change facing the Commission, however, calls for a new look at how revocation proceedings and sanctions are carried out. I appreciate the opportunity to present this testimony to the subcommittee and would be pleased to work with the members in their ongoing consideration of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hankins. Mr. Gianetta, you are now recognized for an opening statement for five minutes. Thank you very much to Chairman Lynch, uh, Congresswoman Norton, and the committee for the invitation and opportunity to share with you some of what we know about what constitutes best practice in parole supervision to the end of reducing recidivism and facilitating successful community reintegration. Uh, the parole field at this point in time is undergoing a tremendous amount of flux. It is coming out of a period during which there was a very heavy reliance on surveillance and monitoring, which, while foundational tools of community supervision have repeatedly been shown by themselves and in the absence of other interventions to have little or no impact on recidivism. And there's been an increasing focus across the country on approaches to parole and parole supervision that seek to change the behavior of parolees. And so uh, at this time, I would like to highlight four broad principles from the research and expert and practitioner uh, consensus that should guide uh, best practices in parole in any jurisdiction. The first is that there should be clear accountability both for those conducting parole 
and for the parolees who are being supervised, accountability for the parolers, the supervisors, in terms of making a clear focus on recidivism reduction as a goal, setting targets, and measuring their performance relative to that, and in parolees in tailoring their conditions so that they're specific to that individual's circumstance so that all their conditions of parole are tied to factors that put them at risk for recidivism and that are in the whole realistic for them to abide by. The second principle is that it is important to strategically allocate limited parole resources in terms of people focusing on moderate to high risk offenders in terms of time, focusing on the critical period immediately after release when the risk of recidivism and other behaviors such as a return to substance abuse are highest, and in terms of place, structuring supervision around the communities and neighborhoods where the highest proportion of parolees return and often where the greatest risk factors for recidivism are present. The third principle, which takes place at the case management level or on the relationship between the parole officer and the parolee, is to build supervision around individualized supervision plans that are informed by validated risk and needs assessment information that involve the parolees in the work of setting their goals so that you can increase their buy-in and their commitment to what, after all, is their behavior change plan, and that reaches out to also engage their informal social support networks, their friends, families, and employers, the people who will continue to be in their life and must be supporting the maintenance of their behavior change long after the formal period of supervision has ended. And the fourth and final principle is to build into the way the parole and parole supervision are conducted, both a rewards and a sanction structure, a reward structure that recognizes and rewards successes when they occur based on research that indicates that rewards and incentives are much more powerful in terms of changing people's behaviors than the threat of sanctions, but also a sanctions policy that recognizes that parole violations are going to occur, that they need to be responded to in a problem-solving way, and that in a way that is graduated, as uh, several of the members of this panel have already mentioned, uh, and that reserve reincarceration for cases where other options have been exhausted or where there is a pressing need to do so. So with those four principles in mind, I would like to make two concluding observations. The first is that in this work of successfully facilitating reintegration through parole supervision, partnerships are absolutely necessary. Broad partnerships incorporating law enforcement, the community, community providers, but also a partnership between the three core entities, the paroling authority, the parole supervision authority, and institutional corrections who really need to come together around a common goal and purpose for reintegrating people who are leaving prison. And in many cases and in jurisdictions across the country, this is not the case and they may collaborate not closely or sometimes work in ways that are at cross purposes. And the final thing I would like to leave you with is that we can look around the country and we can see signs of promise for success in implementing these kind of approaches to parole supervision, looking at the pilot proactive community supervision model in Maryland, which uh, realized success in reducing rearrests and warrants for parole violations, and also some of the outcomes realized by states participating in the transition from prison to community initiative, including Missouri, Georgia, and Michigan, which have all seen improved outcomes in terms of recidivism and returns to prison. So I think that the takeaway message is that there is hope for these kind of approaches to do the kind of work uh, relative to recidivism reduction and community integration that we all want to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Martin Horn, you're, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Norton. Uh, I'd like to talk about just a couple of things that I think uh, will help us to fulfill the um, the goal that uh, uh, Chairman Fullwood put forth, which is to see people succeed. Uh, it, it is uh, my experience that uh, all individuals leaving prison as a group have some statistical probability of su success or failure, and that the challenge to us as a community is to increase the odds that they succeed. Uh, I think that how, the manner in which we release people matters. And another thing that I think matters greatly and that uh, we need to talk about if we're interested in improving public safety, particularly um, as it relates to individuals released from federal prisons back to the district, 
is that how they experience prison matters. Uh, let me say, first of all, that I think there are three critical issues that must be addressed uh, to promote success. Those are sobriety, employment, and housing. I believe that sobriety is uh, a primary issue. It is a primary uh, condition. Uh, I am not a teetotaler. I am not making a moral judgment. But I know this after 40 years, that if an individual leaves prison or jail and starts getting high, they will not succeed. Uh, in order to promote sobriety, we must ensure that their experience in prison is an experience of sobriety, that our prisons and jails are drug-free, and that while in prison and in jail, individuals learn how to stay sober and upon release are provided with connections to those uh, agencies and organizations that can assist them in achieving sobriety. Uh, it is my understanding that uh, SOSA has available to it approximately $15 million for drug treatment. Uh, nonetheless, it is further my understanding that this meets only approximately 25 percent of the need among the uh, uh, persons under their supervision. Uh, it is further uh, uh, my understanding that uh, while in the Bureau of Prisons, approximately 40,000 individuals annually are afforded exposure to their drug and alcohol treatment programs, on any given day there are only 100 D.C. code violators enrolled in these programs. Uh, if we are uh, serious about uh, reducing crime committed by persons uh, upon their release from prison, uh, we have to ensure that uh, they leave prison sober, that they know how to stay sober, and that we provide uh, continuous access to treatment because recovery does not proceed in a straight line. Uh, with respect to employment, uh, uh, it is my understanding that approximately 40 percent of the D.C. code violators who are released are released without a high school diploma. Uh, this makes uh, the challenge of finding work even more difficult as they are entering a workforce uh, market where 80 percent of the workforce in the district has high school diplomas. Um, uh, I think that we must question uh, why, uh, given that D.C. code violators, as I understand it, have a rather lengthy stay in the Bureau of Prisons, uh, we cannot get them educated while they are imprisoned. Uh, in today's world, in order to work, one must have certain documentations. One cannot, as we all know, work without uh, proof of citizenship or uh, legal permission to work uh, and a Social Security number. Uh, and despite the best efforts of uh, CSOSA through their uh, uh, VOTE program, I believe it's called, uh, nonetheless, large numbers of offenders leave prison today without the documents necessary. It is unconscionable in today's uh, day and age that individuals leave prison without uh, the Social Security card, the birth certificate, or the other documents that would make them legally eligible to begin working upon their release from prison. Uh, I think this should become a performance standard within the Bureau of Prisons, and we should ask them to report on the number of persons leaving prison who leave with the requisite documents. Finally, uh, with respect to housing, all of these issues are, of course, made more difficult by the great distance that D.C. code violators are held from the district in federal prisons. Um, it makes obtaining work, obtaining uh, a job all the more difficult. Uh, one way of um, uh, ameliorating this problem is uh, by releasing individuals back into the community through some form of halfway house. Uh, despite the fact that roughly 2,500 individuals return to the district from federal prisons, there are only three uh, uh, residential reentry centers, as I understand it, in the district. I believe that despite efforts to open more of them, uh, the district, as does my own city of New York, experiences what we refer to as NIMBY, not in my backyard. No one wants it. It will take a great deal of political will uh, by the political power structure of the district and the Congress to uh, create the requisite number of halfway houses so that individuals leaving prison leave in a rational way. I also want to point out that uh, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988 imposes restrictions on uh, the uh, access to uh, public housing and Section 8 vouchers uh, uh, by individuals who are uh, convicted of drug crimes. This is uh, something that uh, does stand in the way of reentry. It complicates reentry and something that Congress should reconsider. Um, I also want to finally say that data is critically important. I think that CISOSA has an excellent data collection and management ca capability. I think that we, uh, we ought to adopt the idea that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Uh, and we ought to look at how we manage our workload and our caseloads, focus on the high-risk cases, and pretty much leave the low-risk cases to themselves. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Thornton, you're now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Norton, for 
giving us an opportunity to come and speak uh, today. Uh, I must say I did not prepare a statement because this was a last minute opportunity. I understand, and I, and I apologize for that. It was a mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's fine, but I, I, I will say that Return to Citizens United is a group of formerly incarcerated activists who have taken up the role of getting involved with uh, how the district residents are re-entering re society and what we can do as activists and role models to uh, take part in these conversations, to be represented, you know. Um, and, and I must say, I, I agree with a lot of the things that I've heard. Um, I personally have worked with C. Sosa and I think we're on the right track. Um, me, myself, personally, um, I know sobriety directly relates to reentry. I don't think it's by mistake that um, I have 19 years of sobriety and I've been home, you know, I, and I've been reentered society successfully for 19 years. I know it goes hand in hand, you know, and, and one of the things that my experience have taught me is that when you can you know, um, deal with your addiction, you stand a much better chance of staying in society. Um, education, education is, is real big. Um, me personally, you know, um, as a direct result of education, I've been able to, you know, establish a life for myself. I'm a homeowner now, been married, going on 10 years, and, you know, these, you know, what we're trying to do is, is be the example for uh, other people coming home and reentering society. What, what we've seen happen was that a lot of times when these meetings take place and when um, people are called to heal, it really, a lot of times there's not uh, returning citizens involved in these meetings. There's not people, formerly incarcerated people, who are at the table when all these decisions are being made. And I want to emphasize that we're talking about successfully former incarcerated individuals, individuals who have reentered society successfully and who are beyond the right path now. You know, me personally, as I said, you know, um, homeowner, taxpayer, married, doing all the things that equal citizenship. And now wanting to be a role model and having the avenue to do that, having the means to be able to, you know, be that role model. Uh, one thing I, I will say is that any successful reentry, usually um, there's a, a hand that was reached out from a formerly incarcerated person to show another person a way. I think we have a, a unique ability to meet a person where they are as a result of having been there, you know, and, and, and you know, um, what we at Return of Citizens United is trying to do is have that used, have that used. And, you know, we're we looking to be role models, mentors, peer mentors, and take part in the conversations that are being had. One of the things in, in the District of Columbia, you know, um, I think, you know, one of the things, there's an office that as of right now, is not even, doesn't even have a director whose goal and role it was, from my understanding, to look at reentry and recidivism and how the District of Columbia is dealing with it. I think it's, it's almost criminal that no one is even here representing the District of Columbia because it's the District of Columbia also that, you know, on where are their bids? What are they doing? What is their strategy? What is this office even doing, you know, to, uh, to advance this conversation? You know, what strategies, are, what strategies are in place for, you know, from that office to assist in this conversation? You know, one of the things also, there's a lot of, uh, you know, rules in the books right now that are just not being carried out. Right now, um, I was, you know, I'm also involved with several uh, nonprofit organizations. I'm a trainer with Sasha Bruce Youth Bill, and, and I, you know, I do trades training. And I was just at a, a meeting where, um, a Section 3 meeting, where, I mean, there's rules in the books 
that a lot of development that is taking place in the District of Columbia is mandated to use district residents, return of citizens, but there's no oversight and that's not happening. You know, developers are continuously finding loopholes and ways to get around that happening. And, you know, it's just, you know, um, you know, it's just an ongoing, ongoing process. But again, as a successful person who have successfully re-entered society, I believe we have, a, I know we have a role for this to take place and for, you know, there's a role for us in this and that's why we're here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thornton. I uh, thank you for your testimony and for your example. And I think you did pretty well without a prepared statement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let me begin. I'm, I'm going to yield myself five minutes for some questioning. Uh, I've had uh, a fair amount of dealings with the, the uh, houses of correction in, in the Boston area and in Massachusetts, as well as our prison system. Uh, my own experience from talking to the inmates uh, and visiting the prisons uh, is that the, at least the prisons that I've been to, the, only a handful, uh, maybe four or five, but uh, the, the addiction rate, dual addiction, alcohol, cocaine, heroin, is, is probably uh, one or the other, uh, you know, close to 80, 90 percent from the inmates that I've talked to. And uh, Ms. Poteet, Mr. Horn, Mr. Thornton, you've all, you've all hit on that. Uh, and I'm just wondering, I know there are some differences here uh, in the population and in the administration. Most potent, you, you mentioned uh, these, uh, the non-compliance hearings that you conduct. Uh, what, what are the most uh, common violations that might have a person reincarcerated? What, what do those violations usually consist of? Or are they are they so far across the map that uh, you can't pin any anyone down? No, the most common ones are new arrest, uh, repeated uh, drug violations, uses of drugs, various drugs, uh, loss of contact um, procedures where the offenders fail to report uh, to their CSOs and are unaccountable for. Um, we do even have a small magnitude of those that violate the GPS um, process. Okay. And let me ask, uh, I have, uh, I'm supposed to be managing four bills on the floor in, a, in about a minute. So uh, what is the best way to address, you know, in, in my limited experience, uh, sometimes the connection to the community and to, to other uh, people who have gone through this process successfully, that's a very important uh, element of success. And if we're shipping people uh, outside of the community, and we're breaking that connection between their support system, their families, and, and the, you know, the, the parolee. Uh, you know, I think that's, a, that's counterproductive. How, how, do we, how do we step back from that, take that into consideration, and, uh, and, and try to give these parolees the best chance of success? One of the things that um, we have done at CISOSA was when the Bureau of Prisons transferred a large portion of offenders to Rivers Correctional Facility, we took a tour and a visit down there with staff. And we listened to some of the issues or concerns that the offenders raised. And part of those problems were, number one, they were away from their families, they were without resources, there were lack of programs and the support system. Um, as a result of that, we elected to start the mentoring program where we would do video conferencing from our offices as well as go down there. We would take a uh, pool of staff as well as employment vendors and other community resource activists to the prison so that they could hear what these offenders were in need of prior to their return to the facility. In addition, we did some case management training on site with their staff so they recognized some of the challenges these, these men would face coming back to the District of Columbia. 
some of the resources that we have, some of the problems facing with housing or employment, and tried to keep them in connection with our CSOs so that there was a communication for the offender to have a smooth transition once they come back to the district. So upon their return, we had some idea of what these men needed before they, were, before they arrived. And we could hook them up with some of those resources prior to their arrival here. Now, we couldn't meet all of them because there were some offenders than other sites in the Bureau of Prisons that were so far away that there was a lack of contact. Family support is very critical for these men's success. Some of them have been without support system for so long, have burned bridges, and as a result, they need to reconnect with their families. The substance abuse history was a critical issue, and we knew many of them are abusers as well as just frequent users. They needed to get in some type of substance abuse program. We recognized that we could not meet all of their needs, where those what we could do on site, we uh, hooked them up with those services as well as outpatient or inpatient treatment. Um, I talked about the family integration system, I talk about employment. We had uh, employers sit in the audience when we did video conferencing and talk to the offenders at Rivers. And some of them were interviewed right then in terms of the types of jobs they had, the credentials you needed to, in order to work at these particular jobs, and what they needed to do once they returned home. Um, so those are just some of the things that is so important for these men and women. Um, clothing. Some of them were without clothing, so we worked very closely with uh, our place for women as well as others for the men so that they had suitable clothing. Um, it's recognized in, our t in one of the testimonies that we submitted. We have worked with the Department of Motor Vehicles. As was indicated, these men need driver's license or some types of identification so that they can get employment. Along with that, we were able to get a non-driver's ID so that they could come and get the identification and so when they showed up to their employers, they had some form at that time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my time having expired, I, n I will now recognize uh, the uh, distinguished gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, who I will ask to uh, take the chair if you would. I have some questions that, that the committee wanted to have asked as well as your own. And I'm going to run over to the floor. I've got four bills and hopefully I will be back uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you again for your testimony. I want to start uh, with a question that goes directly to public safety. I think the residents of the District of Columbia would believe, and that's a 2008 District uh, Court for the District of Columbia decision that um, Selman versus Riley, uh, the decision that said that the commission was not applying the correct standard uh, in making parole decisions and that there were excessively long sentences. As a result, uh, it is said that uh, we could see the release of between 500 to 1,000 uh, offenders uh, on pre-release, of course, within the next 18 months from the time of the decision in 2008. And most of these will have been incarcerated because they have been serving excessively long sentences for at least 15 years. I would like to know whether any of these uh, inmates are now released from the 2008 decision. Have they had an effect upon either your workload or on public safety? Uh, they would come under immediately under Sosa and of course get to the commission only later. So I've got to ask both of you what the effect of this 2008 district court federal decision has been and is a decision involving only federal, uh, those sentenced as federal uh, violators and does it affect DC code violators? It, it impacts DC code violators primarily 
uh, the Selman decision um, requires us to use the border parole, DC border parole guidelines that were developed in 1987. Uh, we've subsequently met with um, Gladys Mack and Walter Ridley to talk about the DC parole guidelines. There are about 500 uh, offenders under that decision. We're in the process of reviewing those cases now. Uh, our plan is to have it completed by January the 31st of 2010. Uh, there are people that are being released. Uh, as you know, uh, because of the equitable street time statute, uh, we're in the process of terminating people uh, from supervision. Uh, it, it will have somewhat of an impact, but we're still only talking about 500 people. Uh, and so we are. So it's not a thousand people. It's really at, at the outset, it'll be at the out end, it'll be 500. Yes. Now, do these people who were, were, were serving sentences that were considered long, uh, let me just ask you as a matter of, 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 of um, the data, do people who've served longer sentences like this will tend to be older when they get out? Are they, do they tend to be, I guess this is for you, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the chief who has a long record in law enforcement, do they tend to be more compliant than younger uh, once they are under supervision, uh, either of SOSA or of the Parole Commission, uh, or uh, does the fact that they were convicted of uh, more serious crimes, perhaps, make well, them more difficult for you to handle when they all get out at one time? As you know, we uh, commissioned a study done by Dr. Jim Austin, uh, and we looked at, the study found that the D.C. population was serving twice the time of the national average, um, which was... And that was a matter of D.C. law? Yeah, by the courts. The courts were sentencing people to longer sentences. Is this pre-home rule law? Was this pre-home rule law? Or they're just kind of sailing off into the wind into these, this period as well? You no, know, not being a lawyer, it's, it's, it's a little bit of both. I think that what, what you had is... Uh, back in the 80s, when crack cocaine epidemic came, you ended up with greater sentences because of crack disparity that the Justice Department is looking at now to try to figure out how to better manage this. And we did that in the district as well, yes. you're saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, that was an issue. And the study has shown that that's an issue. But the study also points out uh, something that was said by one of the panelists about uh, people who are committing lesser offenses, that we need to do something about that group and not focus on that group. We need to focus on the group who are violent offenders and take our resources and put them in there, but to figure out what's the best way of managing this group. Um, Mrs. Poteet talked about some of the things that they're doing. As you know, you and I held a hearing with the people at Rivers, and we, what we found is that they weren't programs. It's a privately owned facility uh, for persons who were incarcerated. Um, so we ended up with now the 500-hour program at Rivers. We're still trying to get uh, a, a solid Unicor program there so that people have the opportunity when they come out to, to be successful. One of the things that we have at the Parole Commission is 80% of all the people that we end up having revocation hearings for, are who? They are technical violators. They're low-level offenders. They either test positive, they fail to take the test, they fail to report for supervision. Those are the three problems that we face. And so... Well, let me stop you right there, because here's where my interest in public safety really wakes up. Uh, and you know, Chief, what it means uh, to have violent offenders out here because we don't get to them because we get into the to the dirty urine people now dirty urine people can lead to big problems if they have continuing drug problems so i'm the last person who want to deprecate that right. but I, i've i've got to ask whether first let me start with sasosa uh i did i think uh, mr horn or uh, mr janetta also testified about the, these distinctions does Sosa and then the commission 
prioritize in any way offenders based on the offense to public safety of the offender as he given the large number of folks under supervision that you have. And I'll, I'll ask that particularly of the three of you at the table. Is there any priority so that you get to the ones who are likely to be out here and do violent crimes as cited some statistics thus far for 2009? Or do you catch them, or do you take them, excuse me, first come, forgive me, first serve? The answer to that question is yes. We, we uh, have a risk screener that we apply to all of the offenders that are released. Therefore, we can determine who is at the intensive level or who is at the minimum level, and we supervise them accordingly. And when I say that, the high-risk offenders will face, um, they will have to report more. They will be uh, engaged in the accountability tours with the Metropolitan Police Department, uh, more frequent home visits, more frequent office visits, and all of them are usually uh, subjected to routine substance abuse testing. Um, we will also probably put some of those on GPS uh, to monitor their behavior based on their risk level. And so as they progress and do well, then their um, supervision or less level can be lessened. Um, uh, let me ask about GPS. I'm fascinated by that. Does GPS sure. work um, so that uh, you put someone on GPS most of the time that technology is effective, not effective, highly effective? How would you rate it? I would say that it is very effective. We have approximately 812 people on GPS right now, and we have trained not only the Metropolitan Police Department, but the uh, Capitol Police and Park Police, and so they all have the ability to go in and look and monitor our GPS system. Uh, we have been able to assist uh, the police department in solving crimes because we're able to detect if offenders are in close proximity to an offense that has transpired or on the scene. So do you have a backlog of, of warrants, um, Mr. Uh, I guess it would be Mr. Fullwood, is there, or actually it's the social, I guess issues of warrants. Uh, do you have a backlog of warrants for offenders uh, that's out on the street today? Yes, we do have a backlog of warrants. However, we have been working very closely with the Parole Commission in addressing all of those warrants. And the Metropolitan Police Department has an initiative now that they want all of our warrants and all the PSAs so they can go out and pick some of them up as well. And let me ask you about the, the Superior Court Marshal uh, and to some extent the District Court Marshal uh, um, under the um, senatorial courtesy that the president has given me, I have now advertised to go before my commission first, uh, people for who wish to be superior court marshal because that is a federal um, appointment and district court marshal. Now, I called in the superior court marshal and I was, I must say, <laughs> Uh, amazed to hear how we are doing. Uh, it's a position that hasn't been filled for a very long time, apparently. Uh, how that office is uh, working. It, you know, there are marshals that come from all over the United States to fill in as needed, because after all, this is federal marshals can, can, can fit in. It looks like an office doing the best it can, but without any leadership. Now, if it's hooked up to what you do, uh, I must ask you, how dependent are you on the marshals uh, to, in fact, um, proceed uh, once you, uh, in fact, have a warrant out for an offender? Uh, we've had some positive um, results with the uh, warrant units in both uh, Superior and District Court. We do have a staff member that is detailed over there and works in collaboration with the Marshal Service. So therefore, some of our warrants that need to be picked up, they're able to look at and, and retrieve or act on immediately. So do you think the backlog has, has anything to do with uh, under... Um staffing at the Marshal Service uh, of the Superior Court? I really can't address that. 
I so don't know. So your warrants are proceeding as you would expect then? Uh, no, they probably need to be some, some improvement, yes. Well, if it's not improvement in management and you can't speak to whether or not there are enough marshals, uh, I, all I can tell you, Ms. Pochita, is I need some guidance. I'm now looking for somebody who can staff that office as it should be staffed. I have had complaints from people who, from developers, mm -hmm. that you can't get marshals to go out even after uh, the district is through with all of its processes. So I'm very concerned with any spillover. Let me ask you about continuing along this um, of violent offenders versus others. I'm not sure I even know what I'm talking about. And I commend um, uh, the commission and the DC Criminal Justice Coordinating Council for a study you have commissioned which casts great doubt on this so-called salient factor score used by the commission to assess uh, a offender's likelihood, ex-offender's likelihood mm -hmm. of recidivating after release. Um, the study, as I understand it, found a, at best, weak correlation uh, to recidivism. I must ask you, particularly when this salient score, as I think you testified, uh, Chairman Fullwood, is related to the guidelines, <laughs> um, I, I must ask you, um, do you agree with the findings of this st study and why are you continuing to use it? Do you intend to continue to use uh, well, this salient uh, factor score as it now it has been used is, for years? Uh, uh, this week, as a matter of fact, we're meeting with C. Sosa and um, the study author to try to come up with the rules to govern how we use the study. Uh, we believe that the study is an important study. It will assist us in changing direction. Um, I support the study at this point because I think it will get us to where we need to go. Uh, obviously, one of the difficulties that you have whenever you have substance abuse offenders, it is one thing to say we shouldn't do anything about them. And that's okay if they're not in your neighborhood. Because that's always the difficult part. If you live in Southeast Washington, you don't want to look out your window and see people selling drugs or see people using drugs. You don't want your children to see it. And so that's the difficult part that we're trying to work out. Um, the study has a certain predictive power to it about looking at offenders, um, looking at their history, what they were originally arrested for, what they programmed for while they were in the institution. The, the um, salient factor score had, was developed over time for the federal population. Didn't, Not didn't for have, the D.C. population. Yeah, didn't have anything to do with the D.C. population. So now we're looking at how do you better manage it. Do you uh, think that you should be using, or out of this study, will be using a, a new guidance for predicting uh, how, whether people w should be on the street or not? Do you intend to well, use this? I think it will help us because it, it, it assess risk. It, mm -hmm. it looks at low level offenders, medium level offenders, looks at categories of what the offenses are and what the response ought to be. So, the um, response is uh, the attorney uh, from the PDS talked about the fact that we were giving people the 12 month hit almost automatically. And that's not the way. And that's because of the salient score and guidelines. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's the kind of uniform <laughs> approach uh, to public safety that results in lack of public safety. There's got to be some differences uh, among uh, these uh, people. Uh, and uh, the, uh, that's what we, I, I talk about as a layman, high risk, et cetera. When you know that somebody who's not a violent offender, if we if we used a more scientific uh, scoring could be at higher risk than somebody who's been in jail for 20 years and gets come out now, for example. Mm -hmm. So I'm very concerned that you move toward the best practices and the best data, the best information. And I know under your new leadership that you have been m very, very concerned about this, this salient uh, factor notion that was, and here I make a point, this commission 
is in the throes of huge transformation. What the United States government did was to say, okay, parole commission, first they said you're gonna go out of existence because federal parole was abolished. Then Congress, in its wisdom, says, but wait a minute, if we're taking uh, public safety responsibilities from the District of Columbia for fiscal reasons, we gotta have someone to, to uh, supervise. So it created SOSA for the first time, and it gave new life to the parole uh, commission. This parole commission is the, in many ways, when I ask the chairman about the salient factor, I'm asking about the old before federal parole was abolished system. My grandfather's system is what I'm asking about. What we're asking Sosa, uh, or particularly the commission, and certainly Sosa, which who must work in league uh, with this, and again with your partners, like the Public Defender Service, we are asking you to transform a federal agency, which will continue to be a federal agency, into essentially a local parole agency. There's no parole, I understand, mm -hmm. and you're not local and you're answerable to Congress uh, and not directly to the District of Columbia. This is unheard of in the history of the United States. We do not give local functions to, the, to a federal agency. That's what, what we're asking you to do. And that's why I understand, um, uh, I'm always, wants to call um, Mr. Fullwood, Chief Fullwood. Uh, you know, that's always a superior title as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Chairman Forward, I'm always uh, cognizant of the fact that we're not asking you to, to simply make this thing better. We're simply, at, you, we're simply asking you to turn it on its head uh, uh, because uh, the greatest frustration of this subcommittee is seeing how little of uh, a federal uh, agency can automatically be adapted to the new role you have uh, been given. For example, uh, by the way, the BOP, which also got this new responsibility, Bureau of Prisons, uh, bad as prisons are, this is the best one in the United States and in the whole world. Uh, it, 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 for me to say that about a prison is to talk from how bad perhaps others are. <laughs> but I must say that this Bureau of Prisons has been responsive to us. Uh, all we had to do was to hold a hearing, and we did get uh, the state-of-the-art drug program open to district residents. We did get a new facility, Builder Rivers. We did that with a law, without a change. We did it with oversight. When we were in the minority, there was no oversight uh, of this uh, DC matter. But I'm interested in this, those at risk first, and how often in this country we ignore risk in providing for remedy. Now, this data from the Justice Department on people with mental illnesses who may not appear as the people who are at highest risk, they haven't committed, for, for example, perhaps a, 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 a violent crime. But here I'm quoting from uh, the U.S. Department of Justice, National Institute of Corrections, and MacArthur Foundation study people with mental illnesses, most of whom have co-concurring substance use disorders and face significant clinical, legal, and socioeconomic challenges are twice as likely as people without mental illness to have their community supervision revoked. Knowing that, just that bit of information, it seems to me uh, they almost surely would go to the front of line in need of supervision and perhaps in need of something to keep them from going over the top since they are more likely than others. Can I ask you how they would rate uh, first Sosa in your risk categories? 13% uh, um, of, of the offenders under your supervision are in this category. Whether or not they're high risk or not, their risk because of mental illness and substance abuse apparently uh, puts them at some risk of failing probation. 
Well, Congresswoman, yes, they, they are a risk, but we treat this population a little different only because we recognize the fact that they have, sometimes they are dually diagnosed, not only with the mental illness, but with the substance abuse. And so therefore, one of the things that we did do was create additional teams to supervise this population with lower caseload ratios. And we offer more treatment. And now, this, re this reoffending, uh, uh, not reoffending, but but uh, yeah, in, in the sense that they lose their probation status, does that occur in the district twice as often? Because uh, that study, I believe, was a national study. I'm sorry, would you? Was this loss of their probation status twice as likely as people without illness to have their community supervision revoked? That was from a national study, I believe. Does that occur in the District of Columbia today? That these people who have mental uh, disorders uh, coexisting with their other problems. Uh, are these people twice as likely? Do you know, Ms. Atkins? Hang on, are these people as likely, twice as likely uh, to fail probation? I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that specific study. I do, I'm just I do interested understand in the District from, of Columbia from talking experience. to advocates and from talking to my colleagues um, that many of our clients do have mental health issues and could use increased uh, support and assistance in, in being successful on parole and well, look, I, I, this, this data may not be available, uh, you know, as I'm asking this off the top of my head. I'm, I'm, I, was, I was interested in this, this study. I, I, I need to know. I wish you would get to this committee within 30 days. Um, the uh, number of offenders who have diagnosed mental illnesses, uh, perhaps with other undiagnosed uh, conditions, this, the study says they almost have undiagnosed conditions. Somebody has said that, that they have a mental illness of some kind. And if they've been in the BOP, I think those diagnoses are, are reliable. And then, because I'd like to see what happens with those people. Indeed, Ms. Uh, because I don't know where they would fall in anybody's list of violent or nonviolent. All I know is this national study disturbs me about what kind of responsibility. And I'm very, very pleased to hear you say uh, that. Uh, they do get increased supervision and the rest. I'd just like to know what the outcomes are for that very high risk group. But I'd like to ask Mr. Horn, uh, Mr. Horn, your testimony seems to speak to say that New York City uh, had given uh, special attention to such offenders. Is that true? And do you think, um, I mean, you of course have just the kind of background we'd look to. You have been uh, commissioner of uh, New York City Department of Probation. You have been the commissioner of the New York City uh, Department of Correction. And you are deeply in touch with New York's parole restoration work. Uh, uh, I had understood that New York had paid special attention to these uh, parolees with very special yes. needs. And I wonder if you think that that uh, could, be, could be used, for example, in a system of the kind you've heard testimony about today. Yes. Let me, let me, let me say a couple of things. I've been listening to the conversation. I want to make a, a, an observation. One is, I think it is uh, a mistake to um, assume that there is uh, a, a necessarily a relationship between mental illness and dangerousness and violence. Well, now this study says twice, not, not a dangerousness. Twice as likely to fail under supervision. That's the point. That's and right. And in my experience, many of the people in prison and jail who are diagnosed with a mental illness are as likely to be diagnosed with depression and anxiety as with some form of a uh, 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 psychosis that uh, no, I believe that, that they they include mental conditions, yes. not just psychosis. And, and what we have found, for example, is that many of these individuals fail because their mental illness may cause them to use uh, illegal drugs as a substitute for legal medications, uh, either because they cannot get access to the necessary psychotropic medications or because the side effects of those psychotropic medications are unpleasant and so they choose to self-medicate. And so that's why you see this high um, uh, co uh, incidence of co-occurring disorders, if you, if you will, people who are- And they self-medicate, why? 
their, their mental illness um, causes them discomfort, whether it's hallucinations or, or voices or whatever, or, or simply depression or anxiety, and they can relieve it by using cocaine or heroin or alcohol or marijuana, which are more pleasurable, if you will, than some of the very powerful psychotropic <laughs> pharm legal pharmaceuticals, yes. Uh, the other thing that we have found is that there is a very high correlation between individuals who are mentally ill and individuals who are both homeless and in and out of jail. Oftentimes, uh, we refer to them as frequent users. Uh, these are, we found 10% uh, of our jail population in New York City, for example, uh, had over a five-year period been both in jail four times and in homeless shelters four times in that five-year period, uh, making uh, very great What use. have you done? What, uh, were you able to get um, people with mental conditions to use their pharmaceuticals? Well, there, uh, there are several challenges. The first is we have to uh, make sure that there is a way of paying for their access to that treatment in the community. That means, uh, for that treatment in the community, that means making sure they are eligible for Medicaid, right? Uh, Aren't they almost surely eligible for Medicaid? They probably are, but many of them may have lost their eligibility while they were in prison because they failed to register or because federal law requires that their Medicaid uh, be uh, suspended. Uh, while they're incarcerated and oftentimes... Yeah, but when you get out... Uh, we uh, don't do a good job re-enrolling them. Do we re-enroll them in the District of Columbia and Medicaid? And in CISOSA, our teams work with the offenders, yes, and possibly getting these people re-enrolled with Medicaid. All right, yes. go ahead, Mr. Horn. The other thing is they need, they need assistance with, uh, with housing. Uh, and they need intensive case management. What we've did, done in New York is we have coupled uh, what we call intensive case management, uh, that is workers who work exclusively with the mentally ill offender um, in caseloads of no more than 10 clients in the community. And the other thing we've done is we've given them priority for subsidized housing, and we have found a way, both using Medicaid as well as private foundation funds, to give them wraparound services. They require a great deal of support in the community following release. You cannot deal with them the way you deal with the average uh, non-mentally ill offender and expect them to succeed. They require a great deal well, of Well, let me go to Ms. Hankins then, because that, that, that's important to note in light of your testimony. I must say, perplexing to me that um, the secure residential treatment program is only available to male parolees and supervisees. Now I've got to ask, what? I guess uh, Sosa, uh, considering that drug abuse is two thirds of, of, of those under your supervision and I can't believe that all of those are men, uh, why uh, is this program available only to men? Well, the um, CTF program, yes, initially we had designed that we were going to have a women's unit in. However, during the uh, stages, we determined and found that we had an increasing population of co-occurring in mental health, and we elected to open another unit of mental Yeah, only for men. For men. However, with the new pilot program at the uh, CTF, even though it's a pilot for 32, we are in negotiations with CTF and the Department of Corrections to open a women's unit when we go full blown and then CTF. the correctional treatment facility. That's the pilot program we just started and we will have a women's unit and they are endorsing Let me tell you, Ms. 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 you've been in violation of federal law. I don't care what the reason was. Uh, you know, the, 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 the good girls, <laughs> you know, from the time they are <laughs> children, girls offend less often and it's too easy to overlook them yet uh, that harm done to women may be uh, far greater since no matter what uh, you're talking about, a woman wants to get back her children, is most likely to get them back, if at all possible, when she is released. It is a simply a violation of federal law to have a unit paid for by the United States government that in excludes women. In 30 days, this committee, to the chairman, needs a plan Yes, I understand you're talking. I want to know, I want a plan uh, that would be implemented beginning this fiscal year, begins October 1st, and this member of Congress has worked very hard to get Sosa money. Uh, 
I'd like a plan within 30 days, and I'd like a plan that will be implemented by, it, you, remember, you get your NUMA funds October 1st. The plan should begin its implementation no later than January 1st to pull you out of violation of federal law, not to mention what it, what, what, how it bypasses women who may be in, in need of treatment. I think, frankly, there'll be far fewer. And would, it would have taken nothing to set aside a few uh, places uh, for women. That needs to be done uh, right away. Um, uh, let me quickly go on. Um, very concerned to hear about um, the um, detention for two to four months. For I want elaboration on that for parole rev revocation hearings. Does D.C. pay for the time they're, they're, they're held in the D.C. jail? D.C. government pay for that? For the D.C. Department of Corrections, yes. Well, these people have had their federal parole, uh, 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 their parole revocated by federal agencies. That's, that's something we got to do something about. Then the whole point of transferring these responsibilities to uh, the U.S. Parole Commission and creating SOSA is to take all responsibility for federal, for, I'm sorry, for public safety, for detaining and maintaining them from the D.C. government. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is a violation of the Revitalization Act. So, there I am, uh, so what we do is to transfer to the District of Columbia, uh, essentially um, responsibility, meaning uh, district budget pays for detention for two to four months uh, while you're waiting for parole revocation hearings at the jail uh, and designation to the Bureau of Prisons, also, of course, a federal agency. Now. I think it's Ms. Hankins uh, who testified you have discretion whether to hold them in, in jail or not. I certainly want to make sure that they're not simply let, let out of jail without the appropriate um, factors uh, and circumstances being provided. Uh, but if you have the discretion, uh, if these people are being held and have not yet um, gone back to BOP and adjudicated back, what determines um, whether you're going to jail this offender uh, pending the final revocation or not? How do you determine? How do you make that difficult judgment? And what, what, offender, what percentage of your offenders are held uh, as opposed if to? to some other use of uh, detention. If we detention. determine that there's probable cause and the person goes over to the D.C. jail, they stay there until uh, we have a hearing for revocation purposes. Um, and then they're designated to the Bureau of Prisons to be transferred to a Bureau of Prisons facility. Is, there, is that the only... Uh, um, suppose the person has been arrested for a minor, let's, let's say a minor violation, like driving without a license. That's very bad to do. But let's say they're arrested and later found not guilty. Maybe they left it at home, for example. Um, is um, their parole or release revoked even if these charges were later dropped? It may, depending on what are all the totality of the circumstances. What, what we need to do, let me get to what we need to do. What we need to do is use a greater number of subpoenas. That way the person is not incarcerated. So how we're, would that work? We're, we're, uh, well, we're looking at it now. Summons, summons excuse me. We're looking at summons. Summons, protest. summons as opposed to? As opposed to an arrest warrant for minor offenses. The greater use of summons would, the person wouldn't be over there at the jail. They wouldn't stay there for a longer period of time. Uh, and we would still get the advantage of bringing them in to find out about their behavior. 
the greater use of summons is we're, we're looking at it now at, as to how to greater use summons is for the purpose of not incarcerating people. Um, the PDS agrees with it. They have brought it to our attention also. But we've had this discussion about it. The second thing is we talked about uh, mental health. One of the problems that we have is that we don't utilize all of the all of the support systems that are available in the community now. Uh, we just had um, from the legal services people that came up and talked about greater use of these services that are available in the community. Such as, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, referring them to doctors for treatment. Uh, looking at their crime and looking at the relationship of their crime and whether or not we can supervise them in the community, putting them into halfway houses. I mean, there are a variety of things that you can do. Well, uh, don't you have a, uh, uh, Ms. Protea, have, do you have a limit? Are your halfway houses full? <laughs> the halfway house <laughs> determination is by the Bureau of Prisons. Um, right. If there's beds available, then they determine what- Do you know whether there are beds, beds available at the moment? At Hope Village? Yes, ma'am. Why are, are they not being used, do you know? No, we, we can't make the final determination of who they accept into the halfway house. The Bureau of Prisons Don't does. you ask them how come you have empty beds at the halfway house? It would yes. help you there, therefore get people back into the community and what do they tell you? Yes, ma'am. And in fact, sometimes we have to go back and ask them, will they reconsider, you know, some of the cases. We even have staff at the halfway houses that are there to work when the offenders transition out. Mr. Horn, did you have something to say on that? Uh, yes, and I'm going to have to, I have to go back to the city to teach class tonight, so I'm going to have to run off. But I do want to uh, make an observation that it is not uncommon for halfway houses to be reluctant to accept individuals with mental illness. They may not be equipped to deal with them. No, but she's saying, period, empty beds with or without mental illness. But it was following from the uh, conversation you had with Chief Fullwood about me the mentally ill, and I wanted to draw your attention to a program in Philadelphia called uh, FIRST, which is run uh, through the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, which is a halfway house expressly for individuals with mental illness, uh, and I believe it has been replicated in Erie, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. as well, and I, I would just commend it to the committee as a model that you may well, want to Well, it's something that, that I, in the next appropriation cycle, I might want to suggest to uh, the appropriators for uh, Sosa, uh, but I am very concerned if there are halfway house beds that are not being filled because those people are coming out of jail. It's not like it's just also won't get them. And if there are beds that are not being filled, I don't know if it's for fi fiscal reasons uh, or whether you know what the reasons are. But I'm asking staff uh, to find out within 30 days from the Bureau of Prisons why and, we are not running more people through halfway houses if the beds are available. And, and we know that evidence-based practices show that one of the things that help people to be successful is for them to go to a halfway house. Well, um, Chief, I, I remember that when we first got this responsibility, we showed huge, huge declines in recidivism through the halfway house mechanism. And then there's got to be the NIMBY notion and, and there got to be uh, f uh, fewer and fewer funded. But what bothers me is the notion that there are empty beds, and we will deal with the Bureau of Prisons if that's the case. Mr. Thornton, I have, you asked the question, you know, about the elephant that isn't in the room, and I've got to say the District of Columbia was not invited to this hearing because we couldn't pinpoint uh, either the data or their uh, work. Now, we are in touch with, pre with empowerment, and we commend the city for its work on, on project empowerment. Um, uh, uh, but we're not sure that when the federal government took over uh, imprisonment and parole, whether or not that left the, the city feeling that there was not the kind of responsibility that they had before, indeed any responsibility, except that if people offend criminally or otherwise, if they are to use services, they're going to be our services. Uh, I'd like your view of um, what you think the city facing huge problems uh, with funding of, of programs for law-abiding citizens. 
uh, what the city might do to be more helpful uh, in this regard? Is it simply funding? Um, does the city pay the attention, but it simply doesn't have the funding? Uh, remembering that Sisosa has major responsibility for supervision, not the city. So as, as someone who brought up the city, I thought I ought to ask you what further the city should be doing so that I could speak with the council and the mayor to see if new things might be possible from the city uh, working with Sisosa and with the commission. Well, one thing, that there should be some type of strategy in place with the city. A local strategy quite apart from what the, apart the from, feds are doing. Apart from, from CISO. There and you don't be a see local, such a local strategy? I, I don't see such a local strategy that exists. There's also, right now, we, we brought up um, recovery and the, and the role that recovery plays in successful reintegration. Right now, there's about five buildings that I'm aware of where uh, recovery meetings take place that are being closed down. You know, one of the things. Buildings, what do you mean? Recovery centers, buildings where individuals go in to, you know, for meetings, substance abuse meetings. Now, do you have to go into a city building in order for those meetings to take place? Most of them take place at city buildings, churches, uh, other. Why should those be uh, abolished or closed down? I can understand they may not have the physical premise mm -hmm. premises for it. Okay, the, you, you brought up a good question, why? And, you mean and the programs are being abolished, not it, just the... Well, the specific buildings I'm talking about, um, one is on 24th place. Right now, it's, it houses about, there's 12 meetings that take place throughout the week in that particular building. I went through detox. One of the things, when you go into treatment, you know, one of the things you're told is find NA meetings and AA meetings and places to go, okay? Uh, this particular building I'm talking about, I believe it was operated by APRA. It's being, um, the building is closing down. So what happens when that happens is, now you have about 1,300 people who generally go there for meetings that have no place to go. This, this is very serious. I, what, what we will do, staff will be in touch with the city the city is under tremendous pressure uh, from the Great Recession, as we're now calling it. Uh, and I can understand that programs have to be closed down, but AA you know, is usually done without a city. With, in fact, it can't get any city help because it's a religiously based program. Many of these are done through churches and the rest. And so I will speak with city officials uh, uh, to see what we can do to make sure that uh, they work more closely, I think, probably with Sisosa, to make sure that premises are at least available for meetings which are not government funding to continue to take place. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that would be an important uh, role uh, f uh, for them to play. play. And, you know, the, defenders, the public defender says that um, uh, this, this for you, uh, Chairman Fullwood, that, um, that the commission accepts the recommendations of the hearing officers. Um, almost always. Um, what, what is the review process um, that the commission engages in? Um, what scrutiny that results in so few reversals or are the reversals, let me ask Ms. Hankins truthfully too, uh, by the time they you get to this point, should we not expect perhaps few reversals? What happens is when the hearing examiner um, goes to the facility, has a hearing, they do a report, a summary report. They make a recommendation. Then there is a, what I call a peer review. A second examiner reviews the case and determines whether or not he agrees or disagrees with the finding. If he uh, agrees, it will come upstairs to the commission. So it's already, as it were, been appealed in a manner of speaking oh, to yeah. yet a second person. And, and, and there are times when they, there's a disagreement when there is a third review among the examiners. Uh, the supervisor examiners reviews the case. 
until they get two people to agree on the recommendation. It subsequently comes upstairs. The first commissioner reviews it. If he agrees with it, he signs off. If he doesn't agree with it and he puts in another recommendation that's different than the hearing examiner's recommendation, it then goes to a second commissioner until you get two commissioners who agree on the recommendation. There is, there is a, a, a pretty good review, and they are reversed. You know, they are reversed. Well, Ms. Hankins, uh, uh, you were concerned about this. You heard uh, uh, the chief say that there, there are multiple reviews before it even gets to the commission level. Yes, our, our concern, I, the 85% statistic may or may not be particularly mm -hmm. impressive in comparison to, say, an appellate court review of trial dis judges. I, do, I don't know. What I thought was sort of more interesting was talking to my colleagues who do, who have now a lot of experience before the Parole Commission, represent, have represented over 90% um, of parolees and supervise, uh, supervisees at revocation hearings. And when I say so... If you win a hearing, uh, a hearing, and either um, get a no finding that they uh, are able to um, uh, get the hearing examiner to find that there was no violation, or there's a violation, but for some reason there's a mitigating factor that's been decided so that they've gone below the guidelines. Um, I've asked my colleagues. So when is that? When? How often is that reversed? How often does the repeal, does an appeal improve um, what's happened at the, at the examination? It's the 15% um, that pretty much always gets decided against our clients that I, th that I think is the more stunning statistic, not necessarily the 85% affirmance, um, but that when what error is What would you expect, Ms. Mount, Hankins? What would, I mean, what, what, well, how many people, how much overturning does occurs in, in, in appeals in federal courts, for example? Isn't it rare indeed? Um, not in my office. I mean, we, you know, we, we win reversals. It, it certainly isn't the case that every time there's an error. Fifteen percent of the fifteen percent of the time you. No, no, oh no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Fifteen percent. It isn't the fifth, eighty-five percent and the fifteen percent. It's of the fifteen percent. Which way does that go? And I and and what I, I my just colleague don't know how to determine. I, I, given oh, the number of reviews, he said of the fifteen percent. Well, by the time they get to that many appeals, uh, then I'd have to ask you how much overturning would you expect to occur by that time? How about at least one in the past decade? <laughs> and it's never happened. It's never happened. In fact, they always do it the other way. It's always, it's the government, to, to sort of do it in terms All of right, the One of the reasons for this, Ms. Ha Ms. Hankins, may be, it. and here's where we'd like to get this straightened out. Um, we want to find out what's new and, and what, what has has been happening. Now, Sosa works for a long time with an offender when you, the offender may go through a number of violations before it gets anywhere close to the commission. And here I've been focusing and interested in what happens when it gets to the commission. But I, I believe it was you, Ms. Protea, it was, who talked about kind of putting these two parts of the process together so that um, we know what is um, the sanction, um, the kinds of sanctions that are used at the Sosa level, the kinds of sanctions when you get to the commission level. Um, uh, would you help us understand how you are putting together a new system that relies on sanctions to bring compliance before an offender uh, offends uh, repeatedly. I would call them graduated sanctions. Beginning with Sosa and graduating, uh, if need be, to the commission level. So that we're talking about one system where you begin with, uh, and I use the word sanction to mean if improvement is not made, you're on your way back to jail. Uh, how would graduated sanctions work? How are they working now? 
so that when Ms. Hankins says you'd expect one in a decade to be overturned, uh, you could say more than what common sense tells me. If you've gone through so many steps, maybe you wouldn't expect even one to be overturned. Uh, but I don't know, because I don't know what the graduation is up to the point where you have a really serious appeal, I would say. Because by the time you get to the commission, it ought to be a dead serious appeal. And there should have been um, corrections that uh, perhaps would have been made but for certain complexities in, this, in the situation. So I need to know how this um, new system um, that we've been trying to understand that Chief Fullwood has made some use of, even at, at the commission, how you would knit that together with Sasosa using sanctions up the way so that ultimately the offender would, uh, with graduated sanctions, get to understand that he is deeply now in trouble and either change his behavior or head toward the ultimate sanction of being put back in jail. All right, when you talked about the graduated sanctions, just let me give you a brief um, example. You know, oftentimes you start with the least type of form of sanction for the offender and it may be a verbal reprimand. Well, let's say an offender has positive urines and you continue to do verbal reprimand, verbal reprimand. You're really not addressing the problem and all of the offender knows is that if I use drugs, the only thing that you're going to do is give me a verbal reprimand. This new sanction matrix will apply the appropriate sanction to the correct behavior. For example, how many verbal reprimands, reprimands are you entitled to before you go to something else? Does an offender know that? Exactly. Does he know that now? He No, because sometimes it may depend on the particular CSO, even though we have a graduated well, should it, sanction should matrix. It, should it depend on the CSO? I understand that in the criminal justice system, everything has some discretion. Yes, it does. But and if there's no rule to say, you know, X number of verbal or however you say, you get graduated to the next thing. Uh, I don't know why anybody should take, these are very smart people. Criminals aren't dumb. Uh, they've eluded uh, capture, and they've had some success in the criminal justice system. So I'm looking for sanctions that work and are predictable. If they're not predictable, then who cares? And that's what we... In, in, in tend to incorporate sanctions that are predictable, but I also must say that part of that, even though we may be applying the sanctions, it's up to the appropriate CSO to be able to enforce and relay that type of inter information to the Well, that's up to, to you as management offender. That's correct. to make sure they're trained to do so. I'm, I'm correct. assuming that. If that's a problem, yes, then we really have a problem. No, it's not a problem, but we want to make sure here again that it's the appropriate sanction so that by the time it gets to the commission, they will be able to determine that we have exhausted everything conceivable. Look, I, just a moment. I'm not looking for sentencing guidelines, a proxy for sentencing guidelines here. Here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I know, uh, you know, that this, this terrible system we're trying to get rid of, I don't want to see any version of it repeated in this system. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think the chances for abuse by the staff is greater, indeed, when, in fact, there's not appropriate training on the one hand, and when the offender does not predictably know that unless there is... Um, uh, extraordinary reason, X numbers of this is or that's going to get you to the next sanction, not back to jail, but to the next sanction. Uh, when, do, when would a system at least predictably forecast to the uh, released resident, bearing in mind that there has to be appropriate discretion, when can we expect such a system uh, such a matrix to be in use from Sosa up through and including the U.S. Parole Commission. Congressman Norton, there is a system already in place. We're just only enhancing that system. You know, now don't give me bureaucratic talk. I just said, 
You know, uh, I know there's a system, and I compliment Sasosa on that system. But you cannot set, is, tell me today, or at least you haven't thus far, told me that someone who has had X number of reprimands knows he's on his way to the next part or what the next part would be, or that that is written down to tell him what the next part it will be. And I think part, is, part of the reason is this study that's just been commissioned uh, would, would not enable you to predictably do that yet. And I know, but you see, I'm, you know, it, it, the point is that uh, by the time Ms. Hankins gets the case before the commission, and I don't know, you may represent people before Sosa as well, she ought to be able to point to something uh, that uh, was in place that hasn't taken place, or you ought to be able to say uh, the rule is that unless there are extraordinary circumstances, X number of reprimands, and then you now go on to, and by the way, what would you go on to after verbal reprimand? It could be uh, daily reporting into the uh, CSO's office. It could be uh, GPS. It depends on the behavior, and it depends on the violation. Is, is GPS and daily report, reporting at least as reliable as one another? GPS is it's more controllable where we can monitor what the offender is well, doing. Why would or anybody have somebody come, at, you know, every day if GPS is more reliable? Sometimes we have people come if they're like unemployed and they come and they may go to the day reporting system uh, center. And so therefore they would be uh, seeing their CSO and they'll be telling them exactly what they have done or where they have gone throughout the day if they've uh, gone to and that works just as well as GPS. It is a sanction that we utilize. I'm asking a question. It works. Does it work as well as GPS? It works, but GPS is probably um, better controllable. I don't know. Maybe if somebody's unemployed, you want to have somebody talk to them or something. But I, I'm looking for a way to keep keep track of people. Um, did you want to say something, Ms. Hankin? I, I did. I wanted to sort of t talk about a slightly different type of case that isn't, that isn't quite the graduated sanctions model, although the questions that you're asking are precisely some of the arguments our attorneys might make, which might be why a hearing examiner would say, I'm not going to give you a, a 12 month hit because I, you know, I'm going to reinstate you because, um, because your CSO maybe needs to help you find treatment or something like that. Our concern is, one of our concerns, is that the final decision gets made and it is frequently um, in the 15% where it's overturned, nope, we're gonna go back to the 12 month hit. Forget that we're gonna reinstate you or that we were only gonna give you four months, we're gonna take it back up to the 12 month. And we don't know how that decision got made. But there's a slightly different sort of case, which is the example you gave earlier, for example, of the um, driving without a license, right? There are sort of new offenses, which isn't about graduated sanctions, which is maybe a case was brought in Superior Court and it was dismissed. And now there's, a, there's an allegation of a violation for having committed a new offense. And my colleagues um, are able to convince the hearing examiner that, that, this, that this allegation is unsubstantiated. Now, does the but it's but the hearing but the final decisions is nope we we find that we make we disagree with the credibility finding of the hearing examiner who listened to that officer or that civilian witness and we just disagree with it. That I'm sure that is probably legitimate so you're in some saying, cases. It wait just a minute, never you're goes saying the other that, way. that that the commission overturns the fact finder. Yes, yes. In 15 out of 100 cases, based on their estimate. Is that, but they why, all, you, but, but, is that but, why you want written decisions? Written decisions and some assurance that maybe say they've at least listened to the tape, as opposed to just read a one-page summary that we haven't reviewed and we don't know what they based their decision on. Why haven't you reviewed the summary? We don't, we don't get it. It isn't made public. It's given straight to the commission. They make the final, they make the final recommendation. So it isn't even really the appeal process. It's the final decision. And then we can make a FOIA request to then appeal a decision. Have you made FOIA requests? Make FOIA requests. It's not, however, uh, 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 an excuse or um, a justification for ne getting a continuance of the appeal process if, if we haven't gotten the summary in time. Chairman Forward. We, we signed reinstatement all the time where a person is restored to supervision um, and where there are multiple allegations against them. We do listen at the tapes. 
I personally listen at tapes. So that's not correct. What we need to do is to figure out how to do this stuff better. Uh, one of the things that we have done is we just had Linda Moy up to the commission to talk to the hearing examiners about her views about how we ought to review cases. Um, we have just gotten from Linda Moy a judge who is doing, uh, teaching how to evaluate credibility, who's going to come up and teach at the commission. We know that we got to do this thing better, but there are m most of the time when an offender comes before the parole commission, they have committed multiple violations. There have been graduated san sanctions all along. And, and what we find is that we've got to find better ways to motivate people to not offend. If you look at the sanction program, <clears throat> and Dr. Calvin Johnson, who's sitting back here, um, does some studies on it. When people come through the sanction program, they generally don't get locked back up. They don't. They don't reoffend. Not only do they not reoffend, but they don't test positive. The, the, the positive rate starts to decline because we've developed through CSOSA a, a case management plan, uh, treatment modalities and others to do this stuff better. There's, there, this is an imperfect system because we're dealing with the imperfect people. And so as we continue to reach out to folks to figure out how to do it better, we will do it better. I mean, there's no well, question. Ch uh, Chairman Fullwood, as I had, had earlier said, you're in the throes of recreating the commission itself. Uh, and that means looking at how uh, the commissioners make these decisions. If these graduated sanctions work, uh, uh, in the new regime, it does seem to me um, it, it, it will have an effect here. I, I'm not sure, uh, I'm very concerned about having no basis, uh, even though I, that is not a violation of the Constitution to know how decisions are, are made. I don't, I'm not sure what it would mean. I know as a lawyer, I'd always want to see what the basis I'm not sure what it would mean in terms of workload. Mr. Chairman Fullwood? Can I give you another example? I, I had a sanction hearing. Um, the person had uh, no DC permit. That was his first violation. His second violation, he had no DC permit. He had get arrested a second time. Not only that, but he tested positive. But in the sanction hearing, when we got together with C. Sosa and we interviewed the guy, it was obvious that there were some mental ill problems. He had some cognitive deficits. So I called the police and said, hey, why'd you, why'd you lock this guy up? Um, don't you know that he doesn't understand this problem? And the police took the ticket back. So it's all these kinds of things that happen uh, when you do this. I mean, uh, this and, is and it, where it, you it, have to do this kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, and so at the commission level is when this problem gets straightened out. Yes. Look, um, and it should have been straightened out, uh, obviously, long before that. Uh, it gets back to mental health, mental condition here, um, uh, low cognition on, on the part of, 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 of a release. Just one other thing. There's a young lady sitting behind her, and I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize for not knowing her name. Gretchen. Remember Gretchen. her name? Gretchen who came up and talked about wraparound services for people who are in the system that have mental illness problems, and that we ought to utilize it more. So we're getting ready to invite her up to talk about this whole thing of mental health. Because, I, you know, I, I just don't think that the system is designed to deal with people who have mental health problems. We ought not to be locking these folks up. That's just my personal view. And we certainly ought not re be relocking them up once they're out, right. of, out of prison. Could I ask you, you all, is it your impression that we are sending offenders back to jail for parole violations who've managed to get themselves a job? Yes. 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 We are sending them back. <laughs> Have mercy. Uh, shouldn't that be a factor that, that, how often does that occur? I mean, if you've managed to hold a job, even though there is a violation, how large a factor does uh, being employed weigh 
in whether or not to put you back in jail. It weighs pretty heavy from the commission standpoint because we look at whether or not the person uh, is employed, whether or not they have a stable residence, uh, and we see that in the reports. We see that in the reports from CSOSA where they will note this person has a stable residence, they've been living it for two years. They have been employed for two years, and we should not lock them up, we should send them to the sanction program. So they come to the sanction program. And yet many of them are locked up. And well, why are they locked up? Well, you know, you can have a job and rob people too, Ms. Hank. Ms. Hank. Well, <laughs> well, we have a number of clients who have jobs, who have stayed in, in contact with their community supervision officer, but, but who make some other mistake. Maybe they've tested positive, oh, Mr. Horn is gone, tested positive for marijuana. Now you, really, you, you really say yeah. that somebody has tested positive, got a job, and they're going to send them back to jail. Ms. Hank, well, well, I have no, a well, hard well, time well, believing well, that. They are detained. They are detained. And four months later, if they are reinstated, Why? they probably have lost that job because everyone is detained. Now, th now, th now w let's go back to that, Sosa and uh, Ms. Proteat and, and Commissioner Fullwood. Isn't that counterproductive? That person is unlikely, is he not, to flee uh, if he's managed to get a job. Um, uh, you lock him up for two to four months. How's he? How's he going to retain that job? And God knows he may even be f not sent back ultimately. But how? How does? How is that? Is he in danger of flight, or why must he be retained? I might add, at the expense uh, of the District of Columbia As at the DC jail. I'm sorry, as the chairman and I were talking, you know, those type of offenders, we try to recommend for the sanction hearing or to go to the CTF project. Now, part of this, oh, now let me tell you what the discrepancy here, which is why I'm glad, I, is that the sanctions hearing have been done almost exclusively, have they not, Chief Fullwood by yourself? Mm -hmm. Now, Chief Fullwood was appointed at my request when I was in the minority uh, to, as a commissioner. He became the only commissioner who would do sanctions hearings. So Ms. Hankins is left here with some people who are going through this process, uh, the old process, because there's only one Chief Fullwood. Uh, and the reason that having you all at the same table is important is that it says to the committee that we probably ought to have more people doing sanctions hearings uh, rather than have the precious loss of a job by detaining a really, through retaining of a let's see, be counterproductive, go against our own, <laughs> uh, go against Sosa's and the Commission's own view that employment is the most important uh, uh, thing, perhaps besides housing, that you can have if, if you're released from jail. We, look, I agree that, that employment is important um, and that we ought to do everything short of arresting somebody initially. That greater use of summonses would help to rectify some of that. As we look at what's that group of people that we're gonna use summonses for? Um, we, we've gotta be careful that we don't disregard um, encouraging people to be successful, but to allow them to thwart the process so that they just will disregard what we, we're doing. We've had cases and I'm sure Ms. Hankins is aware of it, where the guy's tested positive 20 times. Didn't go to jail. Did not go to jail. Tried to put him in treatment. And we put him in treatment, and he walks away. Because there is no requirement that you stay there. The person can walk away. And so that's one reason why these secure residential treatment programs become an important part of the process. Even at the sanction center, there are people that go in the sanction center, that walk away from the sanction center, me, me, now, uh, and test positive while they're in the sanction uh, center. Chief Fullwood, on the basis of your testimony, of testimony of Ms. Hankins, I'm going to ask the appropriators uh, in the next appropriation cycle, uh, by which time, of course, uh, we will already have uh, females in uh, treatment uh, in the District of Columbia. But to, to um, ask you to testify before them so that we can get enhanced appropriation for the treatment 
uh, that could keep somebody who has a job from finally just walking away because he's so addicted uh, with all the call on treatment. Yeah, yes, Ms. Hankins, I only have one more question before I let this panel go. This exchange has been amazing, and I think it, 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 it lends uh, to fixing the salient factors. Employment, as shocking as it is, that we might send someone back to jail who has a job, it happens and it happens all the time because having employment isn't a salient factor score, and it leads right in to, right? So it is impossible for someone on parole or supervised that. release to get a perfect uh, score, even under which the means they get a 12 month hit. Even under the old federal guidelines, the whole notion that having a job wouldn't be worth a tinker's dam uh, comes as a, a, a tremendous shock to me, and it says throw the whole thing out. Uh, if you've managed, even in the best of economies, that you ought to go to the front of the line against all of my constituents who are unemployed and law-abiding, got yourself a job, and that doesn't count for anything, the, I don't care whatever else the salient factors had to tell me, they have just told me everything I need to know. The sooner you can, I want to ask you to set a date on it, but you know, um, Ms. Protead and Commissioner Forward, that we'll be waiting to see that go bye-bye. Uh, very soon, and I'll ask you to tell me what's the soonest you, since the study is not, it's only recently come out, I'll be asking you shortly to tell me how soon that can be. Let me, l l lead, let me ask a question about the last big injustice that caught my attention when this matter first came to our attention a few days, uh, a few years ago, and that's about street time, which required the, the District of Columbia to, ad to adopt a new law. I, you know, it struck me in the face that the District of Columbia residents spend longer, have longer sentences than any, any inmates in the United States of America. And I said, how can that be? It's a progressive jurisdiction. How did that happen? And come to find out that time spent on parole uh, before revocation just didn't count. So you've been out clean and good for how many times? Something terrible happened. I don't know what happened. Maybe the woman you'd been with, your wife, left you, <laughs> maybe, I don't know what happened in your life, but, uh, and maybe, I won't even assume one of Miss Hankins, 15%, uh, one of whom should have been, <laughs> should have, should have somehow got overturned. I'm assuming that uh, you were, uh, you had to go back. Please, uh, 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 I understand that DC Pat changed the law. They can, they can at least keep their street time after revocation. Now, make me understand the following. Except when a f an offender is convicted of a felony or sometimes a misdemeanor, while on parole and in situations where offenders are, do not, quote, respond to any reasonable request, end quote, by the parole commission or SOSA. So that looks like a lot of discretion on the part of the commission or even SOSA when it comes to um, street time for misdemeanors, it looks like you can't get it for a felony. Uh, I, I'm not even sure how that decision was made, but it, since it's a home rule decision, I think it must have some meaning. But uh, has, how has this new law been implemented? When was it, oh, it just passed in May of this year. And could you give me some examples of some misdemeanors? It became uh, um, effective on May the 20th. It, um, May 20th, just 2009. 2009. It has been, the implementing rules became effective. Can you put the microphone so I. Uh, excuse me. The implementing rules became effective uh, June the 17th. What uh, the Good Time Credit Act did was to eliminate automatic. Um, revocation of street time. The, the, the new rule permits the commission to do several things. Uh, one is to terminate early termination of supervision. If you've got five years of good time, then we terminate your supervision. Say you're free to go. You haven't created any problems. We've looked at the record. We have a hearing. Even though ordinarily you would not be free to go. Yeah? Right. Uh, and that goes to putting more attention on the high-risk people or the people with mental well, conditions. Yeah. I mean, one of the impacts is if you um, 
a sex offender yeah. or you or somebody of that nature, you're not going to be, you shouldn't be released from supervision. So you're the ones we need to look at. So go ahead, sir. Right. Um, so early termination was a good thing. As a matter of fact, when the uh, law went into effect, uh, the Public Defender Service had a, a conference about uh, this whole issue. Um, I had seven people to approach me. Five of them got released from supervision immediately because the law took effect. Um, they sent me a letter. I wrote a letter. Were these people with, with, with misdemeanors where it's in your discretion? No, they had been, they had committed felonies in the original offense. I but see. They had five years of good time, so they had to go. So we, we released them from supervision. Uh, as you indicated, um, the areas, if it's a felony, then they, they, they lose their time if they commit a new offense. And it's all about whether they commit a new offense. And, and if they are misdemeanor and certain kinds of misdemeanors, they will lose it. If, like what? If Give me examples. Domestic violence. Domestic violence is always not a felony. They may get an assault for domestic violence as a misdemeanor. We pay attention to domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And so we're not going to release them automatically. But we have a hearing to make those determinations. You may not agree with the hearing, but we do have a hearing to try to sort through all of the facts and make an appropriate decision. Ms. Hankins? With, with respect to new offenses, um, it, it actually requires, this is, this is um, one area where it's a little different from how regular revocation works. My understanding is it requires a conviction in court. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't that a case can get dismissed in court. Um, and, and so if there's a new conviction in court, that person's probably going to be sentenced on that anyway. Um, so the question of whether they need to lose their street time um, on top of getting sentenced on a new offense and getting perhaps a sanction for the time they still have to lose their good time um, is a third punishment for the same well, sentence. You, you don't get sentenced for all misdemeanors. I'm sorry? You don't get sentenced for all mi misdemeanors. If, if, if the offense, it would s strike me, if the offense is serious enough that someone should lose their good time for it, then they probably have gotten a sentence for it, misdemeanor or felony. Well, I know what I worry about is, is, is that the council, in its wisdom, uh, did say misdemeanors. Um, if I could say it actually wasn't the council's wisdom. Um, the bill that was proposed um, was, was a lot broader. Um, it got essentially seriously cut back to mirror the federal system because part of the, a little, little part of the Revitalization Act that said that the district cannot change its own parole laws without the concurrence of the U.S. Attorney General. And so while the hearing before the council was unbelievably moving, and I think the votes were there, absolutely the votes were there, um, to pass a broader bill, we had a meeting with the Department of Justice and a number of, and, and a number of their, of the uh, agencies in the Department of Justice, um, and they said, you're not getting that much. Well, that was, they, and they that were able was to the, trump the council. So it's was, not really fair to call it the council I, wisdom I'm, when it was the wisdom of the attorney general who trumped it. But they passed it. Well, they passed wait a it because they, it was this the, law it was, was passed, the and that they, they took the bird in the hand. It's true. They took the bird in the hand. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. This, this, this law was passed in May of this year, mm -hmm. based on effect. consultation with what Justice Department. The prior Justice Department or this prior Justice Department. Right. The prior and I well, do want to say the 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 release was abs was the suggestion of the Parole Commission, the the p authority for early release. It is it is a fantastic part of the law, and we are so happy it's there. Well, so now that we are in the throes of of, of, of transformation, <laughs> Chief Bullwood and Miss Protean, I'm going to ask the new Justice Department uh, to look at the, to review this as well. If what the district was caught having to get the existing Justice Department to agree to whatever it did. That's fair. Under um, administrative law, if there's been a change in the administrative agency, that can be reviewed, asking staff to have that matter reviewed by the Justice Department to see whether any changes might be uh, allowable at least uh, by the city council, in which case we would so advise them. Could I thank each and every one of you for being here? We use these hearings for purpose. We're trying to get something done, not just find out what you know. What you know has been 
uh, exceedingly helpful to us. Um, and I know to the uh, committee, we understand that the uh, subcommittee chair has uh, under his jurisdiction not only the District of Columbia, but for bills on the floor which cover multiple jurisdictions of the subcommittee, I thank Chairman um, Lynch uh, for calling this hearing and for allowing me to go on so long with questions that will help us uh, as we try to help the Commission and SOSA uh, and all who work with them redesign the U.S. Parole Commission to fit uh, the residents of the District of Columbia. Thank you very much, and we'll we'll prepare for the next panel, final panel. Thank you for having us. I, we call uh, the final pa panel, Mr. Samuel Green, who is uh, now, uh, now on supervised release with Sosa, and Mr. James Parker, Also on supervised release, um, uh, Mr. Parker is an employee of the district's Department of Public Works. I'm going to ask Mr. Parker and Mr. Green, or Mr. Green and Mr. Parker, whichever uh, in whichever order you desire uh, to testify. And I want to thank you before you speak for being willing to come forward to assist this subcommittee in the United States Congress. This subcommittee tries whenever possible and whenever appropriate to hear not only from the agencies, whose job it is to tell us what the agencies are trying to do and how successful they think they are. And we heard from some agencies that are trying very uh, diligently for us. Uh, but we can't get a true picture without talking to the clientele of the agency, the public that acts with the agency. That's why your testimony is as important to us uh, this afternoon as the testimony you have just sat through to hear. So may I hear from whoever wants to speak first, would you identify yourself, tell where you're employed, and tell something about yourself? Okay, greetings. My name is James Parker, and I'm an ex-offender ex assigned under the supervision of C-Social. I would like to first thank you, Congress, Congresswoman Norton, and your cohorts for allowing me to present. Um, I've, been, I've been charged with distribution of heroin in 2003. I did 20, 26 months at Rivers Correctional. I got out in night in 2007, and I'm still here. Um, I was listening to everything was going on, and basically I can just give you my experience. Um, being on parole has been a pivotal, pivotal part of my life. I mean, pivotal meaning that um, what has been a pivotal part? I'm sorry. Being on parole has been a pivotal part in my life. Pivotal meaning a lot has transpired in my life since being on parole. Um, death in my family with my daughter. Um, sanctions. A lot of different things has been going on. It is, it has especially helped me from using being on parole from using excuses for the choices and actions I made in my life. My actions are more accounted for now, and I owe my respects for being on parole. Having a parole officer have, have made my journey this time a more smoother transition back into society. 
we are we all have heard the stories of people coming out and not being able to maintain a normal north a normal uh, lifestyle, whether it's from issues of unemployment, substance abuse, family matters, or daily interactions. I pride myself in sustaining from the drug juices and plan on keeping it that way forever. My transition has been, it has been real well because of my parole officer. She had really heightened my ability to stay focused. And I highly recommend this added supervision because we all fall short in our shortcomings. But you also know that there's still some things that, that I think they need to be worked on as far as improving see social and the things that's going on to uh, help people be successful in society. Uh, meaning, I think it's very important that that the um, you guys excuse me, I'm a little nervous. You gotta. Uh, it's very important. You're doing that well. Just keep talking naturally. <laughs> it's very important that your your uh, parole officer is really into you as an individual instead of just as just a job for her. Although being on parole and having a parole officer has many positives, I found that the program need in, in, uh, for improvement. As for me, I was fortunate to have a good parole officer, but there are, that there are not as many as fortunate as me. Being a parole, a good parole officer should not just be a job for them, but a mission to, to help these men and women get back on their feet after being incarcerated. I also think parole officers should be more optimistic in their mindset with dealing with parolees as well as, well as they would want to be treated themselves. We, we are sometimes boxed in a negative connotation that needs to be broken. A lot of us are striving to make a second chance and society worth it. We just want, we just want uh, parole officers to treat, treat us the way that they would want to be treated. Not in my case, I'm just speaking on some of the parolees have that have talked to me to wanted me to bring this to their attention. That's what's going on with them. Um, I think some of the key points was made today and a lot of the things that I wanted to say as far as being positive in society, it really has a lot to do with employment. Um, a, lot of, a lot of parolees are getting out and they're finding it very hard to find jobs. I mean, even though I, um, we all know about our economic structure, it's harder for just people without a felony to get a job. But with a felony, it's a little bit more harder. Also, the housing situation for ex-offenders just getting out is, is terrible. Because when they get out, you know, they might have to go to an environment where the people, the people that they're going with is, is just as worse off as they are. And then you're putting them back into an uh, environment where they really have a messed up choice. They're coming home to their home environment. Might be, people might be on drugs, very low poverty. And then once they get into that, then they might not come home to a house. It might not be a house there when they come home. So... With that, I just want to close, and I want to thank you very much for having me here, and I want to apologize for my nervousness. I've never been around a big crowd and spoken in front of a, lot, a big crowd, but I just want to thank you all for having me. Well, thank you, Mr. Barker, yes, for testimony that, that, I, that was full of information and, and uh, experience that has enriched us. Um, Mr. Samuel Green. 
Good afternoon. My name is Samuel Green. I would also like to thank Congresswoman North and your peers for giving us a forum to talk about community supervision. As you know, I am an ex-offender being supervised by C. Sosa. In 2007, I was convicted for robbery and attempt robbery. I was sentenced to 22 months in prison and served 19 months before being released into the community. As a 22-year-old African-American male living in Washington, D.C. and on supervised release, I have found that it is oftentimes difficult to make adjustments to re-enter in society. The difficulties of finding employment, housing, and education increase with the criminal record. However, through the assistance of C. Sosa and my CSO, I have been able to make pro-social changes, such as remaining drug-free, activity seeking employment, and currently enrolled in the Sasha Bruce Youth Bill program. I want to say that my supervision hasn't been squeaky clean. I had drifted back into using drugs again, influenced by my environment. On occasions, I have used illicit substances. And when that happened, my first thoughts were I would return to jail. But through sanctions, I was able to stay on the street. I have had sanctions such as a verbal reprimand, a CSSO conference, GPS, and the USPS issued letter of reprimand. As a result of these sanctions, I have been compliant with supervision with no positive yawns, and as I said earlier, I am involved in the Sasha Bruce program. I would like to thank my community supervision officer for believing in me and see social for providing me with an opportunity to succeed. Thank you. Well, thank you again uh, as well, Mr. Green, for a testimony that uh, I've already found helpful even before we ask you any questions. And thank you again for your courage in coming forward. Now, you both convicted of pretty serious mm -hmm. felonies, um, and yet uh, here you are in hearing room of the United States Congress able to testify about your lives. Um, I was interested, Mr. Parker, to hear Mr. Green talk about his sanctions. Were, did, were, did you ever have uh, Sosa or the Parole Commission apply sanctions to you? Yes, ma'am. Now, Mr. Green, your sanctions, did you uh, see those sa sanctions as, as more and more of a warning and, and more and more serious uh, a restraints on your release? Yes, ma'am. What, what made the sanctions finally work? You have credited your, both of you have credited, uh, and I must say it says a lot about Sosa staff, uh, that each of these uh, young men have given great credit to the, those who supervise them. Um, but what made the sanctions, in the case of Mr. Parker, I have to ask him what, Ms. Green told us what his sanctions were, what made the sanctions finally uh, hit home to you? Um, because, you know, I got tired of, of making excuses about doing this. What and sanctions the, were applied? Uh, I had a uh, dirty urine. So what was the sound? You had a, a what dirty urine. What, what, what did what, they then do to you? They made, well, I was, when I caught my dirty urine, I was on uh, what they call random. And I take a urinalysis uh, like uh, once every two months. So what they did, what they did was they brought it back to twice. They heightened it up. They brought it back to twice a week. And that was helpful, wasn't it? Oh, was it? Because you know I, I work and I'm married, and now I got to come back in and and go through all this stuff. And then it just made me just realize how much a fool I was and how far I had. Because now you had this greater inconvenience. I didn't back up. And you know that if you didn't come back this time. Yeah, then they then they already told me if I didn't if I had got another one, then they was gonna put me into a GPS system, and there's no I'm forty. I'd be forty two in two more weeks. I mean, I just couldn't even just imagine just somebody just telling me what time to be in the house and 
knowing where I'm going at. And so this graduation of sanctions, so so that they got more and more serious, uh, more and more restrictive. That worked for you as well, then. Definitely. Um, you both employed. I am. I'm, I'm with the uh, Department of Public Works, but it's um, seasonal. So I start back the end of October. How did you get the job, Mr. Parker? Through uh, Project Empowerment, which is a terrific uh, place. Yeah, this is important because this is a completely D.C. funded program. It is outstanding. And here we have the district on its own, uh, quite apart from Sosa, trying to uh, of course, it's had this terrific burden taken off of it, mm -hmm. but it is a city program uh, with one of the highest unemployment rates in the trying to find this. The city gave you a job in the city. Yes. We will try to find out because we know there are f a, a quite uh, substantial, significant number of jobs, city jobs, that now go to... Um, uh, those who've been released on parole, we will ask uh, Sosa to try to help us pinpoint, though we commend the city mm -hmm. for leading by example uh, on that matter. You work for Sasha Bruce? Yes. Mr. Green, what do you do? It's a, it's a GED, and you can achieve your trait there, a trait there, job readiness. So you were there, you don't have a job, you go to that program? Yes. And is that also a, pro a, a project empowerment program? Kind of, yeah, I would say yes. I'm not sure who runs that program, but it is important that here, uh, Mr. Green does not have a job now. Uh, however, uh, I suppose it is Sosa that gives him credit for going to get his GED and for uh, doing job readiness so that he's not on the street uh, competing with people who have no record. He's out here trying to be ready to compete with people who have no record. Could I ask you, um, in, your, uh, in your own opinion, leaving aside the excellent employees, federal employees who have uh, got you, which programs have been most um, supportive or effective for you, the programs you've been through? Or the parts of Sosa, or the commission, or any or any city program, which has been most helpful to you? I think for me it would probably be um, the supervision of C Social. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to really to really get myself back on track before I really go off the edge. Mm -hmm. You know, it really guided me to where I really needed to be at to get me totally focused on what I want to do in life. Um, the job and stuff, it's, it's good, don't get me wrong, and, and it's seasonal. I've been there for two years, so it's seasonal and it's good, but without me going in the right direction, who's to say I would even be there as long as I have been, or even right now? So I will have to, I will have to go back to where it begins at. How about you, Mr. Green? What? Well, may I say Sasha Bruce for the weekly meetings, giving me a sense of home court advantage? You know, just making me feel like a good way is a better way. Um, I, I, what I think you demonstrate when people um, hear about people who have committed crimes, um, they assume we all start at the same start line. How did you start life, Mr. Parker? What was your... Uh, I would say... Um, Probably from a dysfunctional family, uh, my environment, wanting to uh, fit in with the crowd. and. Where'd you live, sir? South. Were you raised by mother and a father? Mother, grandmother, uncle, whoever. Um, so whoever is the important right. point here. Right. That's the difference between your starting line and, mo and most people's. Right. So, so the street got to help raise you. It, it raised me, you know, and it just... It just took me to this point in my life to feel like that, feel that, you know, drugs and getting high, it's so much more to life than that. It's, it's, life is so beautiful when you're sober. It's so beautiful when you can go and take your own. You ain't got to worry about trying to run and find nothing to take and drinking all this water. You can just go in there and just be comfortable. I mean, being able to see your grandkids run and play and do little stuff, you know, and you'll be in a part of their life where you ain't all drugged out or don't want to be around them. 
I mean, just all in all, uh, being incarcerated most of my life, that just being able just to see how beautiful life is, is just a, a, a major adjustment for me. That's what's keeping me focused. That's what's keeping me to never even do drugs no more or be a part of it. I'm just, I'm just thrilled with where I'm at right now. Mr. Green, how did you start out in life? More, more so the same as him, you know, trying to be cool. And Were you raised by your mother and father? Just my mother. Trying to live up to my father. What, what section of the city, Mr. Paul? Southeast, southeast. Mr. Green. Like my father, he was in, in and out of jail all his life. He in jail now, but that's another story. Um, just trying to be cool. I just idolized the bad guys when I was little. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do know what you're saying, Mr. Green. <laughs> <laughs> That's all to my story. Uh, and I, I ask you to tell those two painful stories because it, the, we are so inclined to be judgmental and to assume, well, we all, you know, <laughs> here we all are. All we, all, all we have to do uh, is, what you, is what I did. You know, I had a mother and a father and a grandmother and everyone else surrounding me and changes in family life. Uh, and in circumstances in, in big cities, leaves its issues. And SOSA and the Commission, not to mention the Bureau of Prisons, are left to deal with those issues. I just want to say, as your Congresswoman who represents you, that I'm proud to represent you. Well, we're proud of you for all you have done for us. Well, so. I, got, I had a whole lot more advantages in life. <laughs> just starting out with Coleman and Vila Holmes as parents. Mm -hmm. was all the advantage that most people need. You start that and then life takes care of itself and it wasn't in the most crime ridden part of the city either. Uh, so I gotta judge you from where you started and um, that you've been willing to come forward and tell us not only where you are now, but didn't you didn't start with your life story. Right. You could have said, well, first let me tell you about having no daddy and you know, Mm -hmm. <laughs> my mama having to raise me by herself and being raised in Southeast and it, you, I had to bring that out of you because yes. I want that on the record too right. um, but you've been invited here uh, to as visible evidence of how society benefits uh, from putting uh, little resources into you now that were not put into your lives uh, your early lives uh, by your own families, perhaps, and certainly not uh, until you got through the criminal justice system. So now, um, Mr. Parker, you are a taxpaying <laughs> uh, resident of the District of Columbia. And Mr. Green, if you stay in that program where you're learning a trade and getting your GED, I look forward to your being a taxpayer because we're looking uh, increasingly in the employment sector for people who's been through it and for whom a job means everything. And that's why you will find that there will be people looking for you when this great recession is over. And I appreciate that when, when we came looking for you, you were willing to step forward uh, so that we would know what these services mean and so that you could give me ammunition to go before the Appropriation Committee to make sure that there's more of those services available to the District of Columbia and available also to SOSA and to the U.S. Parole Commission, uh, to the, uh, the Public Defender Services and to those who work in partnership with them. Thank you very much for coming forward. Thank you to all our witnesses. This hearing is adjourned.
or not enough lashes. Applied nightly as instructed by your doctor, Latisse grows lashes in as little as eight weeks with full results in 12 to 16. If you are using prescription products for lowering eye pressure or have a history of eye pressure problems, only use Latisse under close doctor care. May cause eyelid skin darkening, which may be reversible. And there is potential for increased brown iris pigmentation, which is likely permanent. If you develop or experience any eye problems or have eye surgery, consult your doctor immediately. Common side effects include itchy eyes and eye redness. Grow longer, fuller, darker lashes. Ask your doctor if Latisse is right for you. Find a doctor at Latisse.com today. Show and tell. With all the pet hair in the air, my eyes would really itch. But now I have new Zyrtec itchy eye drops. No other allergy itchy eye drop works faster or longer. Zyrtec itchy eye drops work fast, so I can love the air. Find it in the allergy aisle. Got tough stains? Then you need OxyClean. On your dirtiest laundry, use it as a pre-treater. It'll save your clothes and work better than the leading sprays. On carpet or upholstery, OxyClean gets deep down to remove stains and tackle odors, too. Plus, add a scoop of OxyClean to every laundry load to boost detergent and seek out hidden stains. OxyClean whitens whites and is safe on colors without the harmful effects of chlorine bleach. Use OxyClean all around your home. It gets the tough stains out. I wish I knew then what I know now. Get what dermatologists now recommend to fight aging in new Aveeno Positively Ageless Multi-Defense. A combination of a high SPF and powerful antioxidants designed to reduce lines and wrinkles in just four weeks. New from Aveeno. And you, and you. Whoa, look at the water! The cactus and coyotes of home seem a million miles away right now because we're having a Huntington Beach weekend all leading up to tomorrow's Surf City Half Marathon. Are you happy? Is it nice going for a ride with Mama and Dada? If you want to sit, I'll cycle it, dude. I got pounds to lose anyway. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever pulled six people in my cart at once. Say hi, Uncle Jeffy. Hey, Molly, you like this, huh? There's been a brief moment here where the kids have actually enjoyed being in the cab ride, so that's kind of nice. They actually calm down a little and Maybe they like going fast and having the wind in their face. I just wish it was like this all the time. Mommy is so excited about running tomorrow because it's so pretty outside. Guess that brief moment Brian mentioned was all too brief. Oh, I'm holding it, I'm holding it. Okay. I'm really freaking out about being out on this pier right now. I'm just afraid one of these babies is gonna break loose on their own and go under one of these bars and then I'm gonna have to dive 100 feet off this pier and go get them and that water's really cold. <laughs> doggy! You see the doggy? Woof, woof, woof. The minute we get some speed up, most of the babies are happy again, just like their mama. of them are being really, really good and they're just like mellow and kind of like we're chilling at the beach. <laughs> I know, baby, you're tired. And then the other half are like, I'm tired, I want to get off of these. So it was super fun, but I wish the babies were not so tired. Everybody needs a nappy, mama included. 